What is up, large data bankers? Welcome back to the stream. Listen to this incredible pump up music. I'm getting so excited by this music, I can't even believe it. What do you think about it? We're, we're kind of changing playlists here. We're changing playlists. It's a little loud actually in my ears, but I'm getting pretty excited by it. We're no longer doing DMCA lo-fi, we're doing DMCA free synth wave. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the, the feel of the 80s, the feel of the, the databases, you know, sending packets to each other back and forth through that network. You know, you're flying through space, thinking about things, thinking about computer chips talking to each other, stuff like that. Yeah, so it's been a little bit. I feel like I've been on vacation and then we did a short stream and then before that I was kind of also like gone somewhere. I was like out and about, but I feel like I'm back feeling excited. The only weird thing about today's stream, you guys, is that there are men repairing my roof right now. And I think through the magic of OBS, uh, NV Inc audio filters, you're not going to hear it. But if you do, I'm sincerely sorry. And I'm sorry for myself too, because it's really loud. But anyway, it's good to see you guys. Zakaria Buskif. It's nice to see you. I don't, I no longer look like Ibrahim because I shaved my beard, you know? I just got rid of that entirely. S safe, it's good to see you too. I'll try to prove P equals NP by cre creating a very efficient query optimizer. That is a side goal. That's always a side goal. Um, Go as a main programming language, I think it's a great one. I think it's a great programming language. Ah, listen to this jam. Doesn't it feel like we're about to hack the mainframe? What's up, Rail? Welcome to this motivational speech stream. We're just sitting here getting excited. You know? Hmm. Anyway, Zakaria, look, I think it's a great, great language to learn. I think it gets you everything. You got your maps, you got your lists, you got your functions, you got your closures. Uh, you know, you, you got everything in, in Go. I think it's a really good one. In fact, you know, I, I often tell people that Python's a really good one to start with, and I think it is still. But maybe Go is even better, honestly. I'm not sure. Go is such a good programming language, and I think I've been programming it, programming in it for like five years right now. So it feels like I'm just really used to it, and maybe I'm a little biased right now. But it's a really good one. It's a really good one. Lobar, hello, it's uh, nice to see you. Welcome to the stream. Um, we usually don't just sit around doing hype up music, but that's what we're doing right now. I know you really wanna type fast, right? You really wanna type fast. But yeah, so I don't know. This is what's up, you guys. The roofers are on my house. Okay, look, I think I've actually even told you several times about the leak in my bathroom, haven't I? That's like a common subject on the stream, I feel like, or it was last winter. Well. I'm happy to say that these roofers are going to solve that problem once and for all. It's very exciting. And I don't even have to pay for it because I rent this place. Isn't that genius? The only thing I have to pay for is one week of banging and noise. You know what I mean? You kind of hear that. It's human human noise, though, more than uh, machine noise. So at least there's that. It's not like a sanding. It's not like a jackhammering. It's just, just, some, just some nail pounding kind of thing. Anyway, I don't know, guys. That's about that. This week for me has been... A back from vacation week at work. So I feel like it's been chill. I felt relaxed. I felt pretty good, honestly. Um, but I also felt like, I don't know, it's kind of hard to come back from vacation. That first week, it's always a little weird. It's always a little weird. It's like maybe relaxing, maybe you're a little confused, maybe you're a little like trying to get back into the swing of things. So that's what it was like for me. But what was it like for you? How was your week? Did you guys do anything exciting, unexciting, good, bad? Did you get, you know, accepted into university or something like that? Probably that's the wrong time of year for that kind of thing. But uh, tell me, you know, what was up? The other thing I was almost going to do today and then didn't, there was this Lang Jam. Have you guys seen on the internet? Some guy made something called Lang Jam where you work. It's kind of like a weekend game jam, right? Where you're going to make a game in a weekend, except you're going to make a programming language in a weekend. And I almost did that. And then I kind of decided I didn't want to. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of bailed at the last second. It was, it was, I was excited about it, but then I was like, man, I don't know if I have the energy to do this all weekend. The theme was gonna be 
first class comments, which I think is pretty cool. It's a cool theme, but I didn't, it didn't inspire me. So I kind of just bailed. Is anybody else doing that Lang Jam? Do you see anybody else doing that? I feel like there's a few people I follow on Twitter who do it, but uh, anyway, so I was maybe going to do that, but now we're just going to kind of do some CockroachDB programming like we normally do, because that's, you know, let's just get back into that feeling of goodness, that feeling of comfort, right? Um, get, get back into it. So that's, that's the plan. All right. So let's get into it, guys. Let's get into it. So basically, <laughs> it reminds me of JavaScript was created in a few days. Exactly. Exactly. Except maybe these ones would just be, you know, hopefully they wouldn't really turn out to be something that was going to be usable, right? Um, hopefully they'll just be sort of for fun. I was hoping that the, the, the thing would be kind of just like a for fun, you know, for fun little programming language, right? One that uh, maybe isn't so practical. Maybe it's an esoteric language like, you know, uh, Malbolge or, or Brainfuck or whatever, you know, those weird ones. But you know, it doesn't really matter. It does not really matter. Oh, the other exciting thing that happened this week, you guys, is that I went on Go Time, which was super, super fun. So Go Time is this podcast where people talk about Go. And what happened with that was that um, somebody I follow on Twitter said, uh, hey, I'm about to go to uh, talk on Go Time about memory management. And I said on Twitter to respond to him, I'm excited to listen to that. And this guy, Brian Borum, um, he said to me, on a DM, hey, you want to join the podcast? So I said, sure, absolutely. How could I pass up a chance like that? So thank you to Brian. Um, if he's watching this, um, thank you very much. So I joined um, and it was really, really fun. So it was Brian Borum, myself, Matt Ryer, and then um, uh, I forget his name. The Sometimes he does co-hosting on the uh, on the GoTime podcast, but it was super fun. We just kind of talked about memory management. We talked about garbage collection, which is obviously something that we talk about quite a bit here on the stream. But it was really quite fun and it was streamed live. And I think in a couple of weeks, it'll get put out into a edited podcast and stuff like that. So look forward to that. Um, if you're interested in hearing me blather on with some other smarter people about memory management and go. What's up, Kadobes and Sora? Hello, welcome. Okay. So um, should we get into it? What are we doing today? I had two ideas for stuff that we could do today. Um, two ideas. One is that, so basically last time, two weeks ago at this point, can you imagine? It's really been a long time since we did this, um, for real. Um, but two weeks ago, we were working on this project to, uh, improve the KV Cord client library, which is a thing inside of CockroachDB that's very important. That's used every time anybody asks for data from the system. So this is kind of like an every, every query kind of subsystem. And it's the thing that translates between SQL and KV. And so if you recall, what we were working on is improving um, a case in which we have a bit of like an N squared algorithm. That's, you know, the N is usually pretty small, so it usually doesn't matter, but sometimes that N can get big. And you know, when that N gets big, the squared also gets a lot bigger. So we could maybe take a look at doing that. That was one thing that we did last time. Um, and then I had some other ideas that maybe we could look at too, if this gets a little bit, this is a little bit, I mean, it's a little bit like down and dirty, you know? This is kind of a down and dirty project. I like wrote most of the code and it needs to be debugged. <laughs> and some tests are failing in some weird ways and I don't exactly know how I'm gonna get started on fixing it. That's one idea. The other potential idea was that we could think about making a, um, a way to distribute index joins or in lookup joins in a different way. This is something that I've wanted to take a look at for a little while now. Um, so if you remember what index joins and lookup joins are in the database is that they're, they're a join that, um, uh, it, 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 it sort of, it's sort of like what you think of as a nested loop join in your normal database systems for every row in the input, you do a lookup to another table, right? So it's sort of this one at a time thing. You're like, give me a row from here. Give me a row from here instead of a hash join or a merge join where you read everything from both sides and process them in a different way like that. So. The kind of neat thing that you can do with index join and lookup join, you guys, is that if you know ahead of time where the data for the lookup half of the index join or the lookup join is going to live, you could conceivably schedule the processor, the index join or lookup join processor on the node that you know you're going to have to look up to anyway. And you could conceivably make a bunch of them. So you could kind of make a whole stage full of index join and lookup join processors in a distributed way and then route them in the right direction to those processors. So you could conceivably save some time, maybe. 
um, in a distributed setting. I don't know. It's an idea. We've been sort of tossing this around for a little while, and I thought that maybe I could prototype that today as well. But yeah, that's kind of the idea. Uh, Sora says, food break of D&D game. What character do you play, Sora? Archery and C at work. Wow, that sounds pretty impressive. Fun thing for me this work, we released Go117 on Monday. Oh, very cool. Demet sure must work on the Go team, but that is very awesome, obviously. Um, yeah, congrats and thank you, <laughs> I guess I should say. Um, any, let's see, for the audience, what's the, what's the one biggest highlight in Go117 that you'd like to s talk about? Um, I don't think I even really am too familiar with what's in Go117, um, but in Cockroach TV, we kind of <laughs> we kind of lag a little bit behind the Go releases because we're sort of paranoid um, about stuff. So I feel like I don't really pay attention as much as I should about what the uh, the changes to the language are. Oh yeah, wait, I, I think we actually, I actually think that somebody, yeah, this is the whole register ABI thing. Oh, well, that's really exciting. The register ABI thing is really, really exciting. I believe that somebody from our team actually did a little bit of a benchmark with Go117 on some basic workloads and did see at least a small performance improvement, like a full system performance improvement, which is obviously super exciting. Um, but I think that we're probably not going to upgrade until we like cut the branch for our release that's coming out at the end of this year and then switch to working on the release that's going to come out at the beginning of next year. Which is just, I think that's the way we do it. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But um, yeah, the, the register ABI stuff is really, really cool. Thanks for stopping in. So our, uh, Water Genasi Paladin. I don't know what that is, but it sounds awesome. <laughs> See you later. Um, yeah, I think the way, the way the register ABI stuff works is basically that before, I guess the go run or the, it's like the code generation used, it didn't really use registers as much as it could. I guess that's the basic way that I think of what the register ABI stuff is about. Um, I guess I don't really know. A new way of passing function arguments and results that uses registers in a more native way, maybe? Is that how we could say it? Using registers instead of the stack? Yeah, it's really quite exciting. Really very cool stuff. Um, yeah, so I don't know, you guys, I think, I think that's the idea. Why don't I, I think what I'm going to do since I'm getting, I'm feeling a little bit more excited. And since obviously, you know, we have a pretty bad habit on the stream, I would say of like, of, um, being a monkey brain kind of thing, you know, hopping from project to project, but that's just because, Hey, you know, it's hard to finish things on the stream, right? And it's a little bit more exciting to talk about something new and fresh than debug something old and sticky. And the real truth is that I actually haven't taken a look at this patch for two weeks, and I feel like trying to debug it right now is going to be a little bit painful. The Reg ABI performance improvements are awesome. Prune module graphs make working with modules more pleasant. Many other little improvements while being still completely backward compatible, so it's easy to update. That is super cool. Congrats again on the release. Um, okay, so let's actually just go ahead. I'm just gonna maybe I'll just demonstrate a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna just compile this database real quick, and I'm gonna show you what this distributed index and lookup join thing is all about. I feel like that could be a good way of getting into it. No IRL driving stream. Yeah, that was kind of that was a little bit of a special case, Data Dev. Uh, it's nice to see you again, but um, that was a little bit of a special case, and I'm not so sure how often we're gonna do that one. Um, <laughs> I'm not so sure, although it was fun. I had, a, I had a good time. I certainly had a good time with that. I'm feeling like, I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Like synth wave background? I feel like it's a little bit like too constant of a, of a volume level. I feel like that the lo-fi stuff that I usually play, it's like a little chiller, a little quieter. It feels like it's a little less distracting. I'm not sure if it's even loud enough for people to hear. I mean, it's pretty badass, but like, it's kind of like, it's so high energy, you know? <laughs> it's so high energy. Okay, anyway, while this thing compiles, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say cockroach demo nodes equals three. Yes, exactly. It is such a cat jam, such a cat jam. Okay, it's like too loud though, for sure. 
So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to, we're going to make some fake tables. We're going to, uh, we're going to make a new database. We're going to say create database test, use test, create table a, a int primary key, b int. And do we just do that? We're going to do a int, b int, c int, and then we're going to make an index on c maybe. Okay, so the way that this is going to work is that since we have, um, so let me just do a quick overview of what index joins are about. Let's say, let's say I had to figure out all of the rows in this A table um, where A is equal to a certain value. Of course, since this is, we have a primary key on the A column, it means that uh, we can simply get the data in one step by looking up directly on that primary key uh, index, right? So that's what this explain is looking like. Um, it says that I'm going to do a scan and I'm going to do it on a, a span between the values 10 and 10. And since we're looking for 10, that kind of makes sense. We're, we're kind of just using the basic primary index scan kind of thing. OK, um, but let's say what happens when we were to try to look up the B value, since there's no index on B, what happens? So since there's no index on B, of course, what we have to do is a full scan on A. That's why it says full scan here. And we do a filter. So obviously, this is not the most efficient thing. This is usually if you see a query like this in your database and you're ex expecting it to be fast, you're going to be disappointed because this, of course, has to read all that data in the table. And that table could be very big. And let's say the last case now, the last case is going to be a little bit different looking since we do actually have an index that we created on the C column, this index on C. So if I said select star from A where C is equal to 15, we get something that's a little bit different. What we get is a scan with an index join. And what is an index join? That's kind of what the question is, right? So um, the reason that we have to have something special and not just a regular old tight scan like we had with the primary key is that the index that we've created up here index a c i d x it doesn't store all of the values in the table so since there's three columns in this table um a b and c and since the secondary index that we created does not contain b um, they all indexes kind of implicitly contain the primary key columns so they this one sort of by default sort of includes a because it's got to be able to link back to the main row of the, the data, but it doesn't include B. And what that means is that in order to get the value of B that we're going to insert in a particular row, you have to join back with the primary index. And that's what an index join is. It's a way to join back with the primary index. So let's insert some data into this, I guess, as a quick demo. So we're going to say insert into A values one, two, three, and we'll say, whoops, having typing problems today. We'll say select star from A where B is equal to 10. This is going to return nothing. If we say where C is equal to 3, this hopefully will return the right thing. And we have this nice little tool called auto trace um, in the SQL client here, um, where if I say auto trace equals on KV and run the thing again, it's actually going to show me a, a trace of what happened in terms of the commands that were sent from SQL. Um, so what you can hopefully see is the, the main read of that secondary index that's here. That's the scan to the secondary index between three and four, which is, you know, the thing we're looking for. And you can see that it fetched a value and then it's, it, you can see that it emits a second scan and that's the, the value of, um, that's, that's kind of like the, the lookup, right? That's the, the second read that we do on the primary index after we determine what the primary index value even was. So we, we, we look this thing up, we can see that the primary index value was one, and then we send a scan to the primary index with value one. Um, so that's what the second scan is. And we send it and we get back our value and we're done. So, okay, that's the fundamentals. And what, what is the deal with this distributed part that I'm talking about? Um, and let me, let me explain that now. So I'm gonna use a different variant of explain called explain dis sql. What explain dis sql does, um, whoops, let's actually turn off our auto trace. So set auto trace equals off. If we use our explain dis sql, um, what we're going to get is a little 
URL that has the plan and it should be distributed and it's not. And that's because there's too little data in the table, but uh, I can show you a better example of this pretty soon. Um, let's see what Sora says. So Sora says, after looking into our trees, I'm curious how indexes are implemented in Cockroach. Is that also done with an R tree or is there some more magic going on? Yeah, so in Cockroach, um, indexes are represented uh, as, so from the SQL perspective, we can, SQL sort of assumes that there's this big monolithic sorted map that can be looked up into with either point gets or range scans. So that's kind of the, the model that SQL assumes it has. Some database that allows you to have a mapping from key to value where you can look up a key precisely or get a range of keys between two different keys. And you can also delete things and update them. Um, but from the perspective of that monolithic map, how is that implemented? The question is, and the answer is that it's, it's using sort of a LSM tree style uh, thing. So LSM trees is a way of storing indexed sorted data um, that's also stored into disk. So it's it's kind of like a, a data structure that allows you to persist things um, and also have them efficiently in memory. They, they do all sorts of stuff. They are sort of implemented um, for efficiency with respect to solid state disks kind of is, is one way of thinking about it. I guess it's they're probably pretty efficient for, for spinning disks too, but I think the idea was that um, SSDs are good at keeping things immutable for a long time. So the way that LSM trees kind of work is that they they build up these big blocks of immutable data that uh, don't change often and changes get propagated down from the top. Anyway, that's the idea. Hello, Nikon and Hydron. Good to see you guys. Okay, so let me get into the example here. So we're gonna delete from A. Let's just delete A and we can uh, where true. Let's just insert a bunch of data. So insert into A, select, um, insert into A, select G, G plus one, G plus two from generate series one to 10,000 G of G. Okay. So now we have a bunch of data and then we're also going to split this data up um, manually. So normally in Cockroach, if data gets big enough, it'll auto split, but we're going to split it by hand since we're just doing a demo. Alter table A, split at values. We'll do, I don't know, maybe 1000, 2000. I guess it has to look like this too, doesn't it? 2000, 3000, 6000 maybe. Then we're going to say alter table a scatter, and this is going to randomly assign leaseholders to all of the ranges. Okay. So now if we run this explain again, we hopefully will get something different. We don't. Uh, maybe that's because we got unlucky. We'll try again. This one looks the same. Um, this is, why would this always be looking the same? Oh, you know what it probably is? It's because we have a little heuristic that says not to distribute in these cases, but let's, let's maybe say where C is less than 10 and C is greater than zero. Maybe in this case, it'll be different looking. So we'll do a little range scan. Maybe not in that case either. What about, what if, what if we just did a big select star from A without a filter at all? Mm, except we've got to force the index, don't we? So we'll, we'll say A at ACIDX. Uh, what is going on here? So if I say select star, I feel like what's happening is that for some reason, these ranges that I've created are not getting actually scattered. Their leaseholders are not really changing. Hello, Yahor. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that too. Are disk writes buffered in the data structure? Um, e kind of. I think that the way that that stuff works is that, um, yeah, I don't exactly know how, how where the disk writes get buffered in LSM trees. I know that there's a distinction between mem tables, which are which is data that's yet to be flushed, and SS tables, which is data that has been flushed, but I don't exactly know when that flushing happens. Um, but I bet you could look it up by, um, 
I don't know. I, I bet just like a basic LSM tree primer would teach you some of that stuff. Um, you can also look at, so CockroachDB's LSM tree implementation is called Pebble. Um, and so you can kind of take a look at what it's doing if you want. Um, I guess I don't really know though. Nikon's having a bad time. Testing restore and it's tuck at 99% for the past two hours. Disk is at 100% for a one gigabyte database. Disk is at 100% meaning it's the disk got filled up or something else. That does sound, I think that there is uh, lots of IOPS. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I think that there's something about 99% that's meaningful, uh, as cringe as that sounds. Um, I think that a 99% situation <laughs> means that some other operation is happening. Um, but I don't actually remember. Yeah, you should you should file an issue or, or reach out on Slack and maybe somebody will be able to help you. So why is why is everything still on a single range is the question. I thought did I not start it with a couple nodes? I think I tried to. Nodes equals three, right? Select star from CRDB internal dot ranges. No leases. I guess I need ranges. So I guess I can say also show ranges from table A. So it looks like the primary, oh, you know what it probably is? So I think I didn't scatter the index or maybe I didn't split the index. Alter table. Is there an alter index split at? Wait, alter index A, C, I, D, X. Can I do this? Alter index A, C, I, D, X split at values. Okay, so that seemed to work. So maybe if I say alter index A, C, I, D, X scatter, maybe this will work too. Okay, then I should do a select. Whoops. Then what does my explain look like at this point? Aha. So this is looking a bit better. And what's happening here only realize, oh yes, alter index. Exactly. Um, so what's happening here now is that we are, we've partitioned the CIDX into a couple of different ranges. And they happen to live on two out of the three nodes. And so what's happening is that we're asking two of those, two out of those three nodes to read some of that data and stream it out. And since we also have to do a, a join read afterwards to fetch the related primary key data, that's what these join readers are doing. They, we've scheduled them on the same node since we don't, we can sort of do it in parallel is the idea here. We're, we're able to do them in parallel because there's nothing that is sort of, um, there's no data that has to be shared across these lookups. They can, it can happen completely independently. So we sort of do this read of the secondary index data, then we do the lookup of the primary data um, in, in parallel. So here's the idea. The idea is that all of these join reader lookups that we're making over here, they actually are going to be sent to remote nodes most of the time, since we also scattered the primary data, right? So you can imagine that the, the secondary index clustering is not the same as the primary index clustering. Like a, a particular row in that primary index might live on a completely different node, or the leaseholder might live on a completely different node than the secondary index's copy of that same row. And I guess the, the idea here is that there's overhead to asking a remote node to get data. These join readers, they can actually go and talk to any other node under the hood. And they are in fact doing that. Like this join reader here is gonna be possibly asking node one for data, possibly asking node three for data, and possibly asking local node two for some data. But what if we could, what if we could actually make it so that the join reader was always asking the correct node for its data? Um, what, if we, what if we scheduled the join reader such that the output or the, the thing that it's looking up is always living on the local node that it's scheduled on. 
And I think we actually can do that. I think we have all of the tools that we need to make such a thing happen. And maybe the idea is that it could be more efficient because there's going to be fewer network round trips. I think, I think there's going to be fewer, right? If you, let's see, are there, is there actually going to be fewer? Let's say every one, every time that we send between this table reader and this join reader, that's maybe we're sending one batch at a time between these two things. And right now this is free since they're on the same node. And then every time the join reader has to talk to a remote node, it's going to also send a batch. So it kind of actually feels like, but the only thing is that mm, these batches are kind of split up, right? So each time the join reader gets a batch to do, it might have like three different nodes to talk to. And so it'll send three little mini batches. I guess the question is, what if we built big enough batches up <laughs> such that um, we're able to just send one? I think you do get a, a, a modest savings. Maybe it's sort of like n the number of nodes that a particular target of a join reader can possibly live on. And you divide that or you divide the batch size by that. And that's like the number of extra batches that you have to make or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, so the idea, though, is that we could schedule these join readers on the right nodes and then shuffle the data to the proper join reader dynamically um, because we we know exactly where it should live based on this sort of range cache data that we have already. Eh? So what do you guys think? <laughs> you think it'll be possible? I, I kind of feel like this project might be hard, but it's also kind of a thing that I've been, I've wanted to look at it for a little while. So maybe, maybe we can look at that. Um, Maybe we can look at that. So I, th I think ultimately the idea here, Durder, it's nice to see you. It's been quite some time. Welcome back to the old stream. I think the idea here is that we have, we actually have a little piece of infrastructure. I'm not sure if we actually have it already, or I'm not sure if we have it anymore is the, is the thing I should say. There's something called a range router. A range router. And a range router is, so let me explain what a router is. Um, a router is a little thing that lives at the end of a node local data flow that allows you to choose to which node data will be sent. Um, and I think that the way that things work right now is that we have a few different router implementations. Um, one is sort of the trivial router, which I guess is not really listed here, which is just the yeah, the single node router. I guess that maybe that isn't doesn't count as a router, but that's that's the kind that you see here. Um, it just always sends to a particular node. Um, a hash router is used for hash joins and other kinds of things that need to shuffle data to a consistent spot in the in the distributed computation, so that you can always know that a particular bucket's worth of data is going to go to that node. So you can you know finish a sort or finish a hash join or whatever it is properly. So that's what a hash router is. A mirror router is a router that sends data to all of its outputs every time. I don't think we ever use that. And this range router is the last type. And the range router is going to figure out which node to send to based on the contents of the particular data row. It's going to look up which, which node is the leaseholder for a particular index particular for a particular value in a particular index. So I think the idea basically is that we would stick a little range router here, um, configure it so that it was going to send to any of the possible nodes that the the target of the join reader could live on, and then pick which one to send on based on the dynamic value of the row. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's, uh, I'm kind of curious. I'm pretty I'm going into this pretty fresh, not gonna lie. I've never really used what is why is this uh grouping by production? I've never can I turn that off? I don't know. I feel like this is I updated the IDE recently and it's looking kind of weird. How do I edit this to stop doing that? I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so uh, I 
It looks like it's probably just using a test right now. Looks like it's just used in a test right now. And what's more is that, um, what's more is that it, it doesn't actually have a vectorized implementation either. So there's a couple of like kind of irritating things about this project, which is that um, I'm missing an implementation in the vectorized engine and the row based engines implementation is only used in tests. So that's a little bit sad and it might make this project annoying. But let's take a look at the implementation of range router to see if we can understand it, first of all. So range router is a router that assumes the key conf column of incoming rows is a key, is a key, and maps it to a stream based on a matching span. That is, keys in the nth span will be math matched to the nth stream. The key column must be type D bytes. Okay, so this is one way to do it. Um, keys in the nth span will be mapped to the nth stream. That's not exactly quite right. It, it actually looks like it's a little bit smarter than that. Each span has an index. So otherwise without that, I think you would have some trouble if you had uh, spans that weren't connected. And I think that can happen in this case. So I guess the idea would be that we would, just like we do for table reader, where we pick apart all of the, we sort of pick apart all of the different ranges, the spans of the ranges for a particular. Okay, given a span, we partition it into all of the ranges that it exists in. And then we group those range spans by the nodes that are their leaseholders. And we use we would do that same process for this, I guess. And the main the main complication would be that we don't really have any code that can output a span. That's kind of um, new, although we, we did something similar. So so I think actually one thing that got done recently was that in the vectorized engine, we now can do an index join, which is not something that we were able to do before. And so I think what we do here is we do actually construct these spans. And what I don't remember is if we output them in a batch or not. It looks like we don't. So we're not really like making a... Yeah, what's kind of annoying about this as a concept is that we you actually have to like designate a special slot in the data row that's going to be used as the span. There isn't sort of a... I feel like maybe a more elegant way or a more maybe, I don't know if it's more elegant, but something that we could try to do conceivably is create a router that instead of having to accept a span, accept a span as part of its, as part of the row, it would accept a, a set of indexes to construct spans out of, which is basically the same as what the index joiner does. So I, there's, I bet there's actually some, uh, some code sharing that we can do here. Like there's something called span assembler. Maybe we can reuse this span assembler actually. Hello, Pratik. So call span assembler, it generates a series of spans from input batches, which can be used to perform an index join. So it takes a batch, there's a start index and an end index, and then presumably it is also configurable somewhere um, to have the, yeah, the set. The list of starting and end key suffixes for the column families that should be scanned. Order list of utility operators that can encode each key in vectorized fashion. Man, I feel annoyed by whatever is going on. Show write access, show read access. How do I turn off the group by? How 
How do I turn off this group buy stuff? impossible to know oh here we go group by get rid of test production does that fix it keeps it up here man this is uh this is irritating huh who knows how to fix this this is uh driving me bonkers frankly frankly driving me bonkers You'd think that it would um, live in this settings thing, but it is not living in the settings thing. Well, I guess we can just deal with it for now. Prime, what is up? Welcome to the stream. So production right is presumably where we set this thing up and quickly make sure that my computer's notifications are off here. Um, oh, it's seem, seeming impossible. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so new cost span assembler. It takes a table and index and input types and a needed cost. So this actually seems fairly basic and I think that we can reuse this exactly as as is it's a able to generate lookup spans from input batches exactly what we kind of want here i think hello styler i like this podja dink it's very cute a little blobfish right i love a little blobfish so let's assume that we let's assume that we have a little operator i guess what we could just assume is that we we could create a router that is configurable in the same way that the span assembler is configurable. And that way we wouldn't have to create any spans that live in any particular spot in the row, which feels like kind of sketchy anyway. Um, so let's actually go ahead and take a look at the implementation of this thing though, to see that we can understand it. So there's some stuff about semaphores, which seems slightly scary. Maybe that's because maybe there's one go routine per output destination or something. And compute destination, we encode it to create. What is this for? This is saying, ah, I think this is saying, give me the encoded value of that bytes column that has the span in it. And then we say span for data, which gives us the index of the first span that data is within. Okay. So it's fairly straightforward, to be honest. It's fairly straightforward. Um, because this thing is sorted. So let's actually, okay, so I think maybe one step of this project could be implementing range router inside of the vectorize engine. And the second stage, I guess, of this project would be figuring out how to change the, I guess it's the to SQL physical planner to plan one of these things. Let's take a look at that. So just to SQL physical planner. So let's take a look at our routers. When do we make a hash router? Output router spec. Maybe there's, okay, so there's something called by hash. So 
an output router spec can have a pass through, a mirror, a hash, or a range. And the way that the range router spec looks is that it has So the idea that I'm working on is something that I think we've discussed a couple times where we um, schedule multiple index join or lookup join processors on remote nodes based on, and we, we range route to them based on the range that we know the lookup value is going to live on. Does that make sense? And so instead of having one join reader per table reader node. We have one join reader per leaseholder of the remote table. Um, so it's sort of a able to propagate the dist sequelness to not just the table readers that we're starting from, but also the remote nodes that we're reading from in the join readers. What are some good cloud providers that are as good as Cockroach Labs team and responsive? Hmm, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I hear good things. What is Equinix Metal? I hear good things about Equinix Metal. What is this? Bare Metal Server Provider. I hear good things about Equinix. Do you know about Equinix? I think this is something to look at. I don't exactly know what it is, but I hear a lot of good things about it. So range router it has a column encoding it has a datum encoding okay so this is all is this relevant stuff i'm trying to understand it's the index of a column to encode so i think essentially we would what we would put inside of column encoding would be the same as the lookup columns of a particular lookup of a particular join reader. Update, the restore is finally doing something. The number of ranges is decreasing and getting lower. So weird. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> I do think that it would be worth fi filing an issue or opening an issue, uh, opening a discussion topic in the forum um, is another idea. Equinix is a data center company. Must be looking to capture more dev workflows. That sounds about right. Sounds about right. PA Waltz. PA Waltz. I feel like I know you, PA Waltz, don't I? Your name is sounding pretty familiar, but I could be wrong. Hey, yeah. Okay, cool. Well... I can't remember if you've been on the stream before, but uh, welcome. Welcome if not. Um, right. So I think that we would set this up just in the same way as that we set up uh, a index or lookup join. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, thanks for thanks for taking the leap and becoming a chatter. <laughs> um, and spans are going to be configured the same way that the table reader spans are going to be configured. Default dest is a little weird. So basically, this is saying if we've screwed up, then we need to provide a place to go to. And I guess that we, we, what we could do in this case is just send to the local node. Um, I guess this could happen in the case of... I don't know when this would happen. I guess in the case where like maybe the table grew and the spans become bigger and we didn't know about all the spans before or something like that. I, I don't think that this could ever happen, but I suppose it's a good good thing to have as a fail safe. And then column encodings. Encodings is a slice of columns and encoding. Each will be appended to a byte slice. What is this? Each will be appended to a byte slice, which is used as input to the spans. I don't understand this thing. But besides that, 
this actually makes quite a bit of sense and I think it's general enough that we can use just as is. So coming back to this guy, I guess what we would do here, well, first we would have to figure out how this DeSQL physical planner works, which I still am pretty bad at understanding it, but maybe we could take a look at plan join readers. Is that the thing? Plan joins plan joiners. Uh, where's, is there an mind reader thing in here? Hmm. Uh, why would that not be available? Let's see here. Truth be told, I'm having trouble remembering. Okay, so there's a hash joiner spec, a merge joiner spec, and there should be a join reader spec. Yeah. So why is that not in this file? Join reader. It is in this file. I'm just blind for some reason. Okay, no problem. So create plan for index join. When does this get planned? Very simply, when we see an index join. So we could start with this. We could start with this. Create physical plan for plan node. And then the idea right now is that we We either have okay. So what this code is doing um, is it's it's basically teaching the the program how to fit like how to put where to put these two little boxes here. Um, I think at this point in the algorithm, you can imagine that these table readers have been created, and we're trying to figure out where to place these two join readers here. And I think what's happening is that since we see more than one result router, meaning there's two outputs happening that we're playing with at the same time. This is uh, Windows with WSL2 for the OS. Um, so since we have more than one output here, we go to this branch. And what a no grouping stage is, is essentially adding a copy of, a, of the processor that we're talking about onto every result router that we're looking at without any kind of merging business. And so I think what we would want to do to implement this is we would want to say like, I don't know if there's actually even a way to, there's, there might not be like a function for this yet, but the idea is that we would um, create n new, I'm not sure if this is even like a thing that this code knows how to do because it's like going outside of the scope of the nodes that are available in a sense. I'm not sure if that's like a thing to be honest. Um, but we would want to add one new box per node that we need to we need to first actually calculate the nodes on which leaseholders for the other side of the join live, which is kind of weird. We have no precedent for this, Yohor says. <laughs> Extremely um, ominous, I would say. Extremely ominous extremely ominous. In fact, there's probably something at the top where we decide what nodes to even use, right? What does that look like? Hmm. Where do we, okay, let's take a look at the plan table readers, because I think that's going to be the sim most similar one. Uh, to the one that we're going to need to do. So we do partition spans. This is when we have a fixed set of spans, but of course, in this case, we're going to have a non fixed set of spans. I think essentially what we want to do is partition. We want to take a span that has every possible value of the remote table and partition it in the same way that we're partitioning here. I think that's the idea.
And what happens after this? So we get our span partitions. We make a spec. We make a spec. We get some spans. We do some parallelize. And we have the node ID here based on this sp.node. So spans actually has a partition. I mean, it, it actually has a node ID in each of the span. So let's take a look. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look here. We're just going to have some fun. We're going to see what this is going to look like. It might be completely broken, but let's find out. So plan. How come I a plan join reader? Why am I like failing to find this? Create plan for index join, it's called. So. So we're going to make a big uh, if false here. Um, here is our prototype index join distribution code. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a big span. Um, all index span is going to be equal to n dot table dot index dot index desk dot ID. What is the thing where it's like um, create all span or something it's like uh encode index span there's some function that allows you to make a, a span for the whole table that's what i'm looking for now it's not this span from datum row Table span, is this right? It's table descriptor index span. What is this? Index span returns the span that can corresponds to an entire index. Okay, so we actually have it in our descriptor, it looks like. So no. This thing is a index descriptor. I guess what we want is just this guy. Index dot index span? No. So confused. This is a catalog.index. And this thing is a this thing is a scan node. So maybe what I need to do is n.table.table or something. How do I get just the I just want the table of this index. Do I not have that? I feel like I have to have that, right? Indeed, dot desk, okay, thank you. So then we can say index span, right? And then we can give it our SQL codec, DSP dot, uh, do I have, Oh, I must have a plan context dot extended eval context dot codec. And then my ID is going to be my n dot table dot index dot ID. Whoops, this is not, this is my codec. Okay, so here is my all index span. So then the next thing I'm going to do is going to partition the, this span. Partition spans plan context. And then I'm going to say roach pb dot spans of all index span. Okay. So this thing is going to give me back what? Um, partitions and an error. If error is not equal to nil, return nil error. Okay. So then I've got my partitions. And then I say, what do I do at this point? At this point, I, I know. Now, does this give me back? This is grouped by nodes. Find out which nodes are owners for ranges. Splits the spans according to owning nodes. The rest is one for each relevant node, partitioning of the spans. All right. So that is going to be great. What is up? 96. Good to see you. So at this point, we can say for i in range partitions. I guess we can say for partition in range partitions. And 
Is this thing, is this thing big? It doesn't seem so big. Okay, so we're gonna go like this, and the partition should have a node ID, right? It does. It has a spans and a node ID. So I think at this point, it's it's basically, we can basically just create that router spec directly, which is kind of neat, right? We can say, let's make a spec is equal to router spec. Where's my router spec at? So it looks like this, output router spec. So let's grab this, just construct one to see what it's gonna look like. Exec in for pbe.output router spec. So this is gonna be a by range output router spec. And I need to provide some different stuff, I think. I need to make a range router spec. So range router spec is gonna be range router spec. all fields so i've got spans default dest and encoding so my spans and this is this is a what this is a slice of span input matching a span okay so we need to make a bunch of spans so we're going to make our output spans is equal to make rotor it's exec infra pb dot output router spec range router spec span len partitions cyanide for dinner want to create a database quick surveying capabilities quick survey after each 10 minutes to evaluate if students understand quick inserting analyzing and deleting data without persisting i think that to be perfectly honest you should use something like SQLite. If you don't care about persistence, you could use something really, really simple. Um, and SQLite, I mean, it's a great database. But if you don't want persistence, then you can really use, uh, you can use something like SQLite with no problem. I mean, you can also use something even simpler if you don't want persistence, like, you know, you could write, uh, just some in-memory data structures that do it. I guess I don't quite understand. You care you care about performance more than than persisting. I think that to be to my guess is that if you were to use something like SQLite, you would get both good performance and persistence without too much trouble. Um, see, it's going to be very very fast. Um, I'm guessing based on the data type that you're talking about, I'm guessing that it's not going to be a huge amount of data and a database like SQLite, I mean, it's just extraordinarily fast. It's just going to blow your mind with how fast this thing is. Like, you know, you can do analysis and, uh, aggregates and computation over, you know, millions of rows and it'll be extremely, extremely quick. So I definitely, definitely recommend taking a look at SQLite. Okay. Um, you can also take a look at Cockroach Cloud free tier serverless <laughs> if you wanted to, but I, I think that it, it, it might be easier to start with something like SQLite for this use case. I don't know why I didn't say use Cockroach Cloud free tier serverless is my very first answer. That would have been the best salesperson thing for me to do, right? <laughs> hmm. Anyway. All right. So we're going to make our output specs here and we're going to make we're basically just going to copy this data into it. So we're going to say we need we need our i. So we need to say output spans of i dot. So I need an end and a start. Prior to Cockroach, I worked at a company called Newton. So I'm going to set my I don't know why these aren't just normal spans, but I guess it doesn't like why aren't these just normal Roach PB spans, right? Maybe we just don't have, we haven't imported that thing or something. Is that the issue? Kind of feels like we, we have, but yeah. How come we don't just use a Roach PB span here? I don't really understand that. That feels really quite odd to me. 
But hey, it is what it is. We'll just keep it like that for now. Oh God. Okay, so we're gonna say dot start is equal to partition dot spans of i dot. Wait, wait, wait. We have multiple spans per partition. This is not gonna be quite right. We need to we need to make this a little different. We're gonna make it size zero. We're gonna say for in range partitions, and we're gonna have another loop for span in range partition dot spans. We're gonna say output spans is equal to output spans and output spans. Um, So we're gonna go like this. We're gonna say start is gonna be span dot key, and is gonna be span dot end key, and the stream. What in the world is this gonna be? I have no idea how we're gonna set that up, but that's okay. We'll figure that out later. Null bitmap. My project is out of date. I'm gonna edit it. Commands edit project. Um, we're gonna say thinking about distributing index join joiners in cockroach db so here's the idea here's the idea today if you have a plan in which you read a bunch of data from a couple of different nodes and you need to do a join read or an index join to some other table oh shit Uh, I'm not sure if my output, my alert box is really working right now, but thank you for the resub. Welcome back. Why is output spans in a rate not a slice? Okay. So let me quick, let me just give a quick re overview of this project. So the idea is that we're reading a bunch of data from a bunch of different nodes right now. If we need to join that data in a lookup joiny kind of fashion, we always schedule the look, little lookup join processor on the same node that the data was read from. But this this project is about um, scheduling one join reader processor per leaseholder of the remote table of the of the right hand side of the join and sticking them on the leaseholder nodes for all of the ranges in that index that we're joining with. And then we're going to dynamically route each row from the table reader to the remote node that it should be looking up on, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like teaching these join readers to live where they're going to have local access um, for their lookups, if that makes sense. And I have no idea how far I'm going to get on this idea, but it's something I've wanted to look at for quite a while. Why is output spans an array, not a slice? Why is output spans? This is actually a slice, believe it or not, 96. So in Go, um, an array has to have a fixed size value. Um, a slice is, uh, it doesn't have a number in here. Why is that better than putting them where the data was read? Well, it's a hypothesis. I don't actually know if it's going to be better um, this way. I think that in theory, the reason that it would be better is that the batchiness will be improved. So if you imagine what, what each of these tables, what each of the join readers have to do when they get data is that let's say they get like a thousand rows and they split up those a thousand rows into little batches of 300 and we, they send those 300 to three nodes. Um, then it's, it's sort of like three RPCs per thousand things. Whereas I think if we were to stick the join readers where they are able to only read local data, then you get fewer batches, fewer network calls, I think. Um, and I think it's also possible that there'll, there'll be less contention on a particular remote node. Like imagine a particular remote node is responsible for some right-hand side range. It might be getting a lot of concurrent requests to do work. Um, and I guess the hypothesis that I have is that asking that remote node to just do one thing at a time in batch will be more efficient than asking it to do lots of things concurrently. 
I don't know. I mean, I honestly could be completely wrong. I, I don't know. But it seems like a cool idea. <laughs> and I, I, I sort of want to try it. I don't know. Do you have a sense? Do you have a sense? Do you think it would be exactly the same? So we would need to figure out the stream ID is one of the next things. Mm, no idea. Yeah, me neither. I think I think that I would predict if I had to make a prediction now. And by the way, I don't know if I'm going to really be able to finish this project, this stream. It's hard to say because I think it's kind of big. But if I had to predict, I think that you would see some improvements for for a big like, let's say you were doing like a, a giant table reader plus join reader combination on some huge table where you just had to do all of it. I think that in that circumstance, you would see an improved overall throughput. I think that for a lot of concurrent queries or something like that, like if it's a full workload, I don't know. I, I feel like it might make it worse because like DisSQL does have some overhead. Um, but I think that if it was just like a pure throughput question, I, I, I'm guessing that this approach would win a little bit, but I don't know. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> so we need to say to do Jordan, how do we pick this stream ID? Okay. So we create our output spans. We have our output spans here. I think that this point, what we do is we say our spec. That is a topic I don't think I'm going to broach on stream. It's just a little bit out of my comfort zone for discussion, to be honest. But it seems upsetting, is what I'll say about that. Okay, so my default dest, if not nil, is the index of the stream to send rows that do not match any span. I think I'm going to leave this nil. If nil, a row that does not match a span will produce an error in the router. I think I'm going to leave this nil. So what about my encodings? Encodings is a slice of columns and encodings. Each will be appended to a bytes. Yeah, I still don't, I have no idea what this field is really about, to be honest. I don't understand it. And in fact, we never write to it. So I'm sort of suspicious that it doesn't mean anything. It might be hard to decide when to use this new physical planning versus the old one. Both options will be better depending on the circumstances. Yeah, I'm getting that same feeling too. I was thinking that like the, the heuristic that we use for the table reader, whether to plan table readers at all on remote nodes is like, it's basically about the size of the span, right? And so I was thinking that maybe we could do some heuristic based on just like data cardinality basically. Um, but I don't know. Thinking like, you know, if there's a lot of estimated inputs to the join reader, then it might be cool to plan. It might be, a, <laughs> well, besides it being cool, it, it might be efficient, more efficient to plan with remote nodes. But we would have to test it. I think this is one of those things that it's pretty hard to predict without having some empirical data. I don't know. Yeah, just an experiment, really. So encodings is a slice of columns and encodings. What is this? Each will be appended to a byte size, which is used as the input to the spans. Oh, do you think that this is... Oh, oh, I see. This is just which are the which are the columns that are going to get included in the computation. So that actually is fine. I the This encoding part, I don't really understand, honestly. Is it, oh, it's ascending versus descending. Okay, actually it makes perfect sense. So to make our encodings, I think it's going to be basically the same as whatever the index join has in its lookup columns or whatever, right? So n dot calls. Call 
Columns is no, so this is not right. Key columns, Ind indices of the primary key columns in the input plan. So this is, we want to look at our index or our key calls, right? Indices of the PK columns in the input plan. So I guess these are the, these are like ordinals in the each of the input rows, which is that, is that what we want here? What we want is column is the index of a column to encode. It does seem to be the same thing. So let's just see what happens if we just uh, make it that. So we're going to say encodings is equal to make exec infra pb dot output router spec range router spec column encoding. And the length is going to be len and dot key calls for i range and dot key calls encodings of i dot column is equal to and dot key calls of i hello tombo i think we can just cast this guy so then how do we just determine whether it's ascending or descending though How do we do that? Oh, I guess what we do is... <clears throat> I mean, we have to, oh, I, I guess what we, we, we can sort of assume things, right? It's, it's a, it's, is it all of the primary key columns? I guess we just look up what the primary key columns are encoded as. Um, Join reader assumes that the PK columns are a prefix. This is different. But the point is that we, we definitely know that the index columns are the same as the number of the primary key columns. So I think what we essentially do here is say, um, we say encodings of I dot encoding is equal to, then we get to say N dot table dot index dot there should be like a columns thing here what does this thing have there should be some kind of Do I just have to get the index desk or key column IDs? Ideally, this method should be called as, as rarely as possible. Okay, presumably I should not do that. Should not do that. But how do I get the columns? I see, get key columns and then get key column ID. So I have to say something like, So n.table.index dot get key column ID of I right and then I need to this is just a column ID so I've got to say n.table.index dot get column how do I I don't understand this Get key column direction. Oh, I see. So I, I can actually just call that directly. Directly get key column direction. And this gives me back a desk PB index descriptor direction, which I need to convert into that other type of thing, which is really plenty fun. Plenty fun. 
How do I convert these things back and forth? Here's a question. Datum encoding. Okay, sending E. Where do we... Encoding dir to datum encoding. This is yet a different type of thing, right? This is not an encoding dir. This is a index descriptor, index descriptor direction. Surely there's a way to convert between these things, right? Do I just, I could just, I guess I could just do it myself. Um, This is so annoying. Okay, uh, datum encoding sending key, else descending key. All right, so that was truly terrible. Really lots of fun. Okay. And the next step at this point is what? We've got to additionally do nothing. I think that's it. So our encodings will be encodings. We've got our special output router spec at this point. And the next idea here, I guess actually what we can do is put this, can we put this at the bottom? I mean, ultimately what I wanna do is like, Ultimately, what I want to do is like take this spec that I've created here. I think this thing is going to be sort of correct with or without the new router. So what I want to do is like move this down below, I guess. So we create our spec. And I think our output column should be the same as well. And I guess it's sort of like we want it to be a different conditional here. So we'll just, yeah, we'll maybe just put it for here for now. And I think what we want to do at this point is like, instead of using this add no grouping stage or add single group stage, we would need to like make some other, we would sort of need to copy this functionality and change it a little bit or something like that. I guess what we probably want to do is go back and look at the table readers thing again to see how it works. Cause I never really remember find table readers. Cause I don't think we use, we do add no input stage add no input stage. So it's gonna probably be a little different. Creates a stage of processors that don't have any input from the other stages. So, mm, new stage with first node.
So I guess I would run new stage on nodes, right? Add stage on nodes. Adds a stage of processors that take in a single input logical stream on the specified nodes and connects them to a previous node via a hash router. Okay, so it is kind of just, maybe this is the thing I should kind of clone then. Um, it takes a bunch of nodes. We would pass this in as the ones that the join reader should be planned on. Hmm, pretty tough stuff. Connect the result streams to the processors. Set the new result routers. This stuff truly confuses me every time I look at it. Truly. So what we'll do is we'll say, add stage on nodes and we'll pass in. So we have to create our list of nodes here. So our list of nodes is gonna be coming out of our partitions list. So um, remote nodes is equal to make roachpb.node ID len partitions. So we're going to say remote nodes of i is equal to, I guess we need our i here. We need partition dot node. All right, so we have our remote nodes list. We're adding this new stage on these nodes. The processor core union. Wait, I thought I made a node. Oh, it's called remote nodes, remote nodes. So our processor core union is going to be exec infra pb dot processor core union join reader spec. No, wait, this is our output router spec. We need to pass in our join reader spec that we made up above. And I think everything else remains the same. Post. Oh, wait, I think I'm passing. This is kind of the wrong function. I think I need this. I think I need this guy, new stage ID. Add stages, add stage on nodes is the way to go. You could refactor the method to take an output router spec. That is an interesting idea. So rather than hack up a new thing, could I manage to avoid passing these hash calls directly? Yeah, I think you're totally right. We would just take one of these things. We would just take one of these things. So what if we did the following? What if we said, what if we change this to be add hash stage, add hash stage on nodes. Add hash routed stage. Well, maybe I should just change them all. There's only a few. Maybe we'll do it that way. We'll just change them all. So input types and result types should say the same. Merge ordering, I don't really know. Okay, so we're going to change this to take a output router spec. You know, it's a little weird. No, it's not that weird. Okay, so we're going to take this. We're going to call this what? Um, output router spec, output router spec. But let's make it a little bit more clear, like what this thing even is, because truthfully, it's confusing, right? It's, it's going to be the Ah, I see, via the specified, the specified output router spec. Okay. So let's copy this and let's go to all the callers of add stage on nodes. <laughs> and instead of, oh, this is our new one. So here, instead of passing in our distinct columns, we're going to pass in a 
exec infra routers back. That contains distinct spec dot distinct dot distinct columns. And we'll get rid of this. Um, it looks like we need to delete our hash columns. And the next one, I mean, it does seem like we could put a little helper function, honestly, right? I feel like... I don't know. This file is already so tricky to use that I can't really tell. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do the helper function. I feel like that's going to be a bit better. So we're going to rename this called add hash routed stage on nodes. I'm going to rename all of these. Then we're going to implement it by invoking a new function called physical plan add stage on nodes. And it's going to take all the same arguments, except instead of taking the hash columns, it's going to take the output router spec. And and then down here, we're going to simply put output router spec, like so. And then up here, we're going to say return e dot at stage on nodes, nodes core post. And then we get to create our new little output router spec here. Like so. Uh, output router spec input types result types merge ord routers yeah and what is wrong with this too many arguments to return it needs to return whoops what did this thing return it, it never returned anything this is an Iris keyboard, Haza 2K. If you press exclamation point keyboard, you can find out more. Okay, so hash routed stage. Let's copy this comment here and we'll put it down. Had stage on nodes adds a stage of processors that take in a single input like connects them to the previous input in previous stage via the past in output router spec. All right, so now that that's taken care of, the next thing that we can do is go back to what we were working on, which was up here, I guess, where was it? Over here. Oh, it was in a different file. So. Over here, we're going to say add stage on nodes, and we'll pass in our new route put, uh, output router spec. A lot of soldering. I actually took the easy way out, and I bought it from somebody on the Reddit mech marketplace. So I, didn't, I did zero soldering, which was pretty awesome. This is the Go programming language. Why did this get edited exactly? Okay, so here's where we're going to make our change. Add stage on nodes. Um, and now we're going to pass in our output router spec, which we already have. It's called spec. And our input types, our types, our result types. What are our result types? I guess our result types are our types and our input types are what? Our input types 
or what? Preve stage result type. So it's p dot get result types, I guess. P dot get result or plan dot get result types. Our output types. Our merge ordering, presumably, is whatever this thing is going to return. Don't know. DSP dot convert ordering, and dot rec ordering plan dot plan to stream call map. And the last thing is our our routers, and I don't know exactly what that's going to be about. Routers are a list of processor IDX. So what I'm working on is an enhancement to CockroachDB um, to improve its uh, distribution of a particular kind of SQL join called this join reader or index joiner. So CockroachDB is a distributed SQL database, which you should check out and use for all of your database needs. <laughs> um, right. So. <laughs> yeah, hashtag add exactly. I should I should make sure to add hashtag add to this stream now. One hundred percent. Um, I do work for Cockroach Labs. Um, yes, <laughs> but I only stream on Fridays, so streaming is not my full time job. If that's what you're asking. So what all what all what all happened to what we want to do is look at this guy and see who is passing in these routers and what do they really mean? Plan dot result routers. Plan dot result routers. I am not completely clear on what this means, honestly. Does it just mean the last set? Yeah, it's just the current set of nodes that there are basically so I, I guess it's also just the same as before where we we pass in plan dot result routers and i think that's all there is to it i don't exactly know why that's how things work to be honest but that's okay okay so that's that so we do add sage our nodes we pass in our new spec type which we've created and then i think that's like all there is to it, right? <laughs> um, potentially, then we say return plan. No. And so here we've commented this out, obviously, but that is the main idea. So at this point, right, we still need to fix this stream ID stuff, which I don't exactly know. I don't exactly know what this is about. The index of the destination stream. The index of the destination stream. So presumably it's like this guy, right? But I don't know how this really works. Honestly, I don't know how this really works. So Linux in eight, seven, what is up? The vacation was great. Thank you very much. And thanks for, yeah, I really enjoyed talking on go time. I thought that was a lot of fun. Glad you got to tune in. Um, yeah, vacation was great. I, I did some good beach chilling activities and basically relaxed, swam, saw some whales. That was really cool. 
Um, but uh, yeah, really like Cape Cod. It's a great place to go on vacation. So how much during a beach time was I thinking about databases? To be honest, really not very much. I, I really relaxed and I would recommend doing that if you can on your vacation. It makes a big difference. I feel like vacations where I think about work end up being less relaxing, <laughs> even though it can be pretty tempting. Visit India sometime? I'd love to. I think one of my friends might be getting married in India at some point in the next one to two years, in which case I'll definitely go. You rented a bouncy house for your party this weekend? That is awesome. Now, I don't know if I would exactly call a bouncy house relaxing, but, um, you know, to each their own. How do I ban this thing? You're an adult and you make good decisions. Yeah, it sounds sounds like it. Um So yeah, what what is this streams business about? Do we do we construct the streams here? Where do we construct the streams? Connect the result streams to the processors. So for each bucket in the list of nodes, we say merge result streams. It connects a set of result routers to a synchronizer. The synchronizer is configured with the provided ordering. Connect the result streams to the processors. Um, hmm. you know, one, one question that I actually have right now is where do we actually like process this thing? Presumably it's in, is it in setup flow? Only pass through and hash routers are supported. So. So when, where do we actually decide what to do with this by hash? Where do we actually decide what to do with this? Output router spec by hash. So here's make hash router. Here's make range router. Let's take another look at this guy, the original implementation. The original implementation says, hello, Marilia. The original implementation says search for the output span for a particular key. And then it gives me back the index. And then what do I do? I say return I, and this is doing what? Compute destination. Compute destination picks the ith output. <laughs> okay, so, hmm. I mean, I think what I basically do is just put counter, right? Like, don't I just put zero through N in this thing? Can I just put, uh, put I here in 32 of I?
So if, yeah, I don't really know, honestly. For each of the partitions, for each of the spans, I make the stream for this span the ith partition. So meaning, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit arbitrary. It's basically just saying I'm going to create an index and all of the key spans, all of the keys that live in this particular span will go to the ith stream. So then on the other end, I'm just going to set things up so it works that way. And I think that basically makes sense, maybe. Um, so, you know, actually what I could try to do, I'm going to just set this to be true. And of course, this will fail in the vectorize engine, but it actually should work in the row engine. And so I'm wondering what will happen if I just run a little test. Probably things will crash, but we'll see. Maybe they won't. We'll learn something. Okay, so let's go ahead and run our demo. So not everything crashed so far, which is a good sign. Um, let's create our table. We're going to insert our data. We're going to alter our index. We're going to alter our table. We're going to scatter both. And then we're going to do explain the SQL select star. See what happens. Hey, well, that seems cool. <laughs> Something worked, right? Looks like there was some infrastructure to support this already. We already use range router for bulk IO ops, e.g. restore processor planning. Oh, interesting. Okay, this this guy's voice is not going to fly. Um, restore processor planning. Range router spec span. How about that? Oh my gosh, we can't ha we cannot have lyrics. That is not correct. We cannot have lyrics. Can you believe that? Yeah, anyway. What can we have without lyrics here? Oh my gosh, no, 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 lyrics. How about this? But this new playlist, I'm not sure if it's really working out, to be honest. We might have to res revert to the old playlist here in a second. What about this? Ooh, this sounds good. This sounds this sounds like the right the right feel for hacking, right? John oh no! Was a race car driver. His family was murdered for a race he was destined to lose. What? To win. <laughs> now he is searching for the medal. I'm gonna hear this one out. Night to find a faceless killer and a reason to live. <laughs> okay, this is the perfect song to hear the result of what happens when I actually run this query. Okay, great. We got a very nice little error span to not after previous span so that's a good thing right span d not after previous span verify spans are sorted and non-overlapping okay so i had to sort them i guess but that's that's uh, not so hard to do right it's not so hard to do let's make that happen let's make that happen so our spans here our output spans here. So we're going to say, um, how are we going to sort these output spans? We're going to say sort dot slice. 
output spans funk i j int bool so how do we sort these spans do the spans have a little sort uh Bytes that compare. What does the restore processor do in this case, actually? I'm kind of curious. Oh, it has a little. We'll just, we'll just copy this code, because why not? Man, imagine if imagine what we could be doing right now if we had GitHub Copilot. I feel like this would be we would just be flying. Don't you think? Don't you think we'd be so efficient? I'm actually really curious to see how good GitHub Copilot would be on anything, database or not. Okay, so we're gonna do what you've seen so far. It's been a joke, really. I thought I think that people have been saying it's pretty good. No, I, mean, I could be wrong. Alter table, split at alter index. Oops, alter index, split at alter index scatter. Alter table, scatter. Wouldn't GitHub Copilot have trouble with new slash innovative things? Yes, but I think that most new slash innovative things are composed of non-new, non-innovative things. So there's that. No span found for key. I feel it's good to automate writing redundant code in the best possible way. I agree. No span found for key, eh? No span found for key. So this happens if there's no default destination. And this means that we're not producing anything proper in our span for data field, which kind of makes sense. It's not surprising that we've screwed this up. So I think what we'll do now is what? We need to figure out <laughs> why don't we print out our output spans? Why don't we print out our output span? So we're going to say, um, Format dot, we'll just say, maybe, yeah, we'll just do format dot print line output spans of output spans, oops, of len output spans minus one. We'll try that. So we get a basic sense of what we're generating in this spec to see why it's not working yet. I guess we could just try it now. Okay, so it actually worked fine when things were not distributed, which I guess maybe makes some sense. Um, split at, keep it like this. What about now? That one works fine. So on the other hand, if we do alter table, alter table, split at, scatter, scatter, then I think we're going to have some problems, right? So our spans are getting printed as useless stuff here, which is a little bit annoying. What we need to do is, why are these getting printed as useless, annoying things? Oh, you know, it's because we really want to be printing out just span here. Um, should probably make a little test rather than doing this by hand so many times, huh? Let's make a little logic test. So we're going to make a... Let's 
So we'll make a new logic test here. Um, okay, so copy, what is it? Uh, package SQL logic test, test data logic test, explain, and we'll call this Uh, we'll call it dist join reader. So dist join reader, take a look at this. And the logic test is going to be, what is it called? Five node just five node. Is it called just five node? I think it's just called five node. Okay, so it's gonna be five node. We're gonna say create, we're basically gonna do the same thing. Create table B, e, A and primary key, B int. Actually, you know what we can do is we can, uh, we omit the data types. Then we can do a create table as, which is gonna save a little bit of typing. Create table as select G, G plus one, G plus two from generate series one through 10,000. Let's do 1,000. We don't really need to do 10,000. It's a little bit extra. Then we're going to say statement OK. Um, alter table T split at values. Uh, 300, 600, 900. Alter index. Uh, a C I D X split at values, or it's actually T C I D X, right? Then we're going to say scatter and alter table scatter. And we can, we can actually just go like this, can't we? All right. And then the last thing that we get to do is say statement OK. Select star from E at E C I D X and see what happens. Okay, so then we can say make test package equals make test base logic files equals dist join reader. See what happens. What about this song? This sounds pretty good. Man, it really does feel like we're in the matrix, huh? Cat jam. Okay. It feels like you're in the matrix until you get something wrong, and then it's just a little bit depressing. So we're gonna get rid of our create table as here. Yeah, we're we're synth waving critique, absolutely. Let's see int, then we're gonna just say insert into T. Like this. Okay, so column G does not exist. That is true. We need to say G of G. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It, it feels like we're in, in Zuck's matrix. Exactly. So TC IDX does not exist. Why is that? Isn't it called TC IDX? Great. Table T A and primary key B int B int index of C show indexes from table T for table T on table T from T what the heck okay T C I D X I thought it was called T C T C I D X oh alter table T scatter. Okay, back to business. 
No span found for key again. Okay, so let's take a look at the spans that were generated now. We have table 53 from 1 to 100, and then or one from nothing to 900, and then from 900 to the end, which seems right to me. Here we have from nothing to 300, from 300 to 600, and then from 900 to the end again. And then from 600 to 900. I mean, this looks basically fine to me. Everything should be included in this. So what this is telling me is that the algorithm that's being used to construct the spans is not working properly, uh, which is interesting. Very interesting. So let's take a look at what it's doing. Span for data. Row of call.encode. I mean, it kind of seems like the issue here is that we're not producing we're not producing the the prefix you know it's uh it's actually a little weird this range router thing it's not actually expecting to see just columns in the streams it's expecting to see right i think we actually sort of knew this already actually so it's expecting to actually just see It's expecting to see like, yeah, this. It, it assumes the key comp column of an incoming row is a key and maps it to a stream based on a matching span. So it, it's actually, uh, it's annoying. It's rather annoying. I don't know what to do about this. I don't know quite what to do about this at all. I mean, I think what we could do is we could make a, a, a prefix and configure a prefix here. So I mean, I feel like that would be fine for now. So new, new range, make range router. But then it requires editing the spec again, which is unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah, this is a little janky. It's a little janky. Um, basically, the problem is that this guy expects to see fully encoded keys for the things that it's going to be routing by, but that's not what we have. We have something a little bit different. What we, oh, you know what we could do actually, you know what we could do, and this is actually kind of neat. What we do is we, after we partition these spans, we can chop off the front of them. And I think that should uh, maybe fix the issue, right? We could chop off, chop off this table part. Um, It's just internode across servers. Numa nodes. It does not take into account Numa nodes. I mean, you could configure your database to pay attention to that by running multiple processors per machine or multiple machines per machine or something, nodes per machine, but no, we're definitely not thinking about that here. Um, yeah, this is... Uh, it's not exactly. It's not exactly good here. Um, Cause the thing that we're, we're actually not even gonna get this one here. We're just gonna get. We're just gonna get this six hundred nine. I mean, I wonder what would happen if I just said. Um, when I do this partition spans guy, um, what have we said also to 
do this guy. Make index key prefix, and then I chop it off. So I'm going to say prefix is equal to make index key prefix. Plan context dot extended dot codec. And our desk is going to be our n dot table dot desk dot desk. And our index I oh wait, no, this is just our desk. And our index ID is going to be our n.table.index.getID as well. And then here, what we basically say is span.key of up to prefix or something like that, or up to len of prefix. I don't think this is really going to work either. I think this is going to like crash, but we'll see. OK, so. And the idea would be that, you know, since we're stripping off that prefix, then hopefully the generated keys will be in the sort of range that the spans are going to be in as well. I don't know if this makes any sense at all, TBH. Span three, not after its previous span. OK, so we didn't. Uh... Mm. I guess I'm kind of curious to see what it looks like when I do this. So let me just print this out. But I don't know why it wouldn't sort properly because we're still sorting the stupid thing, right? So. So now what we have is, oh, I, I did it backwards. That's the issue. I need to say not from the beginning to the len of prefix, but I need to say from the len of prefix to the end. So I just have my my slice backwards, basically. OK, so now what we get is no span found for key again. But these spans are actually looking a lot better. Let's run let's run this again. And what we're going to do now is actually from min to table 300 from table 600 I mean what we need to do is actually construct a f like an end key that has everything which I'm not sure if that's possible. I, I guess we need to say like if output spans of len output spans minus one dot end key is equal to nil or something. Is there a way to get like the end? What is the end? What's like the maximal key? Is that a thing? The end key of the key range, it's empty if the key range contains only a single key. Otherwise, it must order strictly after key in such a case. So how do we get the maximum value? I don't think there is such a thing, right? It's like that's like not not a possible uh, not a possibility. Right? I can't remember how that works. Is, is there is there a max? Is there a max? There is a there's a key max, right? Key max. There is a key max, right? Okay, so we can we can we we can do a key max. So basically, what we'll say here, let's let's pull this guy out. Oops, pull this guy out. 
pull this guy out. End key. And we'll say if end key, if len end key is equal to zero, end key is equal to roach pb dot max. Okay. So now I think we're gonna be, you know, sort of cooking with gas, so to speak. And let's try this again. So how about this? Hey, okay, so it did something good. It did something good. It did something good. That's actually, I'm impressed that it did anything at all, to be honest. Select star from T at TCIDX. Easy clap, exactly. I am dusty. What is up, by the way? Okay, so here's what we can do to validate that this is doing anything good. We can say select sum of A from T at TCIDX, maybe. Um, and we can say query I, I mean, let's make this a sum int and it should be, I don't know. Let's see what this returns here. Uh, found expected, but found 500, 500. So 500, 500 is what it's finding. And is that correct or not? I have no idea. Why don't we also make a quick explain test for this? So we're going to do query T explain select. So expected, but found, and it's got a scalar group by, but it doesn't have an index join. So that's a fail. Why doesn't this have an index join? Oh, it's because it needs to be some into B, not A. So this has to be B, this has to be B. Let's try it again. So it does have an index join, which is awesome. Let's just do this with test flags equals rewrite. So what we get is a scan and an index join in a group. And we get this number here, which I don't know if it's correct to be honest, but I have a feeling it probably is. And you know, um, we should be able to validate this by going like this, right? Oh, I need to put a space in between it just to, so we're gonna run this twice, one with the five node plan and one with the local plan. And it does appear like it's passing maybe. I was running with rewrite. Something is a bit different here. Why is that? Um, ah, distribution local versus distribution full. Okay, well that is extremely cool. I have to admit. I have to admit that this is extremely cool. Let's take a look at the explain disql plan. Um, and of course this isn't gonna be, this is gonna be not deterministic. So we would need to manually choose where the nodes are. And I think there's a bunch of other tests that do that. So maybe we should just copy one of those. So five node. Maybe we should just copy one of those. Just SQL join, let's say. So don't we copy? Hmm. Where is the thing where we just copy or we where we set a bunch of specific? Is it is it an exec builder? It looks like it's this. Okay, so let's let's just copy whatever we're doing here. So we're gonna do this experimental relocate business here. So split into 10 parts. So let's just get rid of this here. Except I think what we need to do is, this has got to be I times 100. And then we're gonna do relocate, alter table, data, experimental relocate, select array. Don't really understand this, but uh, let's just try it. See what happens. Relation data does not exist. Of course it does not exist. It's actually going to be called uh, T. Okay, and the issue now is that we have distribution full. Distribution local, distribution full. We should split the index. That is a great point. I think that the, the main table, I think, is the one that matters in this case, but you're right that we should just do both. 
Um, when did I decide to become a programmer? Um, I guess probably I always did a lot of programming. I kind of started programming in middle school, but it was kind of just a hobby just for fun playing around. And then in college is when I decided to become a more professional oriented programmer because I, I failed as a, as a mathematician. That was my, I was trying to become a mathematician, but it didn't really work out. Um, so we're going to say T C I D X. Okay. So then we're going to do the same thing for this. Why did math not work out? Uh, basically because I was too dumb. <laughs> That's the way that I think about it. It was way harder than I, than I expected. And I couldn't, uh, I, to be honest, I think it was more like I didn't try hard enough. I might also be too dumb, but I think the main thing was that I didn't try hard enough. I had to try a lot harder to make it work. I think I wanted to do physics after calc based stuff. I decided to pivot. Okay. So, but found is a distribution full vectorized false. Okay. That also makes sense. So vectorized is going to be false in this case, because we don't support the range router in vectorized just yet. This alter stuff is extremely slow, I have to say. Okay, so now let's take a look at the explain to SQL to see what happens. So why don't we just convert this to say explain to SQL, actually. What math did I study in college? I did like, I don't know. I did like some analysis stuff. I did, I started to do an algebra course. We're talking like, you know, algebra, algebra. And it was, it was extremely hard. And I eventually just got discouraged and uh, stopped. But I don't know anything about math. So don't ask me about math. Okay, so what do we get? We get a diagram. It's a giant diagram. So here's the output. This doesn't look right to me. This does not look correct at all. It, I think I've screwed up the way the data distribution was done, honestly. Um, let's take a look at this again. So we did split at. We need to populate the range cache by reading from the table. Is that for realsies? Is it this thing? I guess I can just try statement. Okay. Select star from P. We'll just try that. Do I also need it from T at TC? Okay. So now what we get is it's annoying that this thing will not, uh, let's see. So this is definitely wrong. I think that there's still something wrong with, um, the way that I've done this split at business, right? Um, I forgot to multiply, but I thought that the way I don't really know how experimental relocate works, but I thought that it was based on, I thought that it was based on, I thought that it was based on, um, What the heck does this even mean? I don't, I have no idea how experimental relocate works. Is there experimental relocate? Oh, is that what it is? It's the range start. I see. You're having to decide whether to study math or CS, which is why you're wondering, have you tried, are you in college yet or are you in high school? Okay. This is looking more promising. So now we're going to cat you're in college soon. 
I think what I would do if I were you. Oh, yes. Look at this. Look at this puppy. This is looking pretty good. <laughs> I think that what I would do if I were you is um, take some math courses and take some CS courses in your first year and see how you like them. I don't I mean, I hope that you don't have to decide up front. Normally you don't. I think that would be a little bit odd if you had to decide up front. Um, so what I would recommend for you is to take a couple of the intro classes from both majors, since, you know, with whichever way you go, both of those classes are going to help you for sure. See what college level math is like and see if it's to your liking. It, it also, I don't know, I feel like it depends on what school you're at and what the courses are and all sorts of different things. So it really, it's really hard to give universal advice. I, I would definitely just take advantage of, you know, it's, depending on what kind of college you are, a lot of the times it's like part of college is to explore what you like, right? It's like, that's the purpose. You don't have to know ahead of time. Many times you, you should be able to explore a little bit and, and find out what you like and what you don't. Restore is still working. I see that there's 1 million plus statements of insert into system.table statistics. That does sound like it's a problem, Nikon. Um, that doesn't sound expected for sure. Definitely, definitely sounds issue worthy. I don't know why that would be the case. Yeah. So I think what I want to do real quick here is just to make sure that this thing is working. I want to distribute the main table a little bit or the index a little bit less than the main table. So what I want to do here is I want to set the index just to be um, relocate the secondary index just to a couple of the nodes to make sure we can distribute to nodes that were not included in the original set of table reader placements. Statement okay. What is up, Haratok? Whoa, look at this. This is what we're call this is this is an unprecedented plan, right? Right, Yohor? This is a spooky plan right here for sure. Unprecedented plan. <laughs> um, why do we use SQL instead of NoSQL? So this is a, we're working on a database that is SQL. And the reason that the database is SQL is that we think that SQL is a more powerful model for application developers to represent their data models. So. We think that the existence of transactions and the relational model is a really helpful thing for making robust and uh, you know scalable applications. Do I do work for Cockroach Labs? I do work for Cockroach Labs. Um, okay. So what now? I don't know. What now? That was a little bit easier than I was expected. I guess the main next thing would be to add the range router for vectorize that would probably be the big missing piece here right i'm actually really shocked that it just sort of worked but uh i think the next step would be to making a range router for vectorize is there a tool to easily define schemas or models for databases it's a good question um i'm not exactly sure i think i think that you have to like you know think about it in a sense like i, I think that um if you're using an orm for example there's no getting around writing your model in the in the RM's language, right? And if you do that, it'll translate it for you into SQL. But I also recommend learning a little SQL. It's not so complicated and it's really worth it. It'll it'll really learn, it'll teach you a lot. It'll make you more proficient with um with your data, especially if you're writing a program that's using SQL under the hood. It's definitely good to know some SQL uh, for that. <clears throat> so I feel like this is a pretty cool, this is a pretty cool output, honestly. Um, this is a pretty cool output. I kind of want to, I kind of want to tweet about it just for fun. We're, we're going to make a tweet. We're going to make a tweet. We're going to make a tweet. Okay. This tweet is going to be called. 
an unprecedented plan. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to say. Here's what we're going to say. Um, working on something new on the stream. This is a plan that pushes pushes Rose uh, to join uh, to pushes input Rose to look up joins to the nodes that the right hand side of the join will live on before uh, live on before doing the lookup. An unprecedented plan. Note the lack of table readers on nodes four and five. Hey, that's me. <laughs> Okay, wait, check this out. Eh? <laughs> also, wow, nice, nice response from uh, P. Alvaro here. Pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. All right, so, um, I guess, why don't we make a quick commit here? Uh, well, we can't really make a commit yet because the truth is that we have to make this configurable, don't we? <laughs> it's worrying whenever you realize that you're not muted by various people. We would have to make this configurable somehow. So why don't we make a quick little cluster setting for now, maybe. Is there, is there another setting that we're using here? Just anywhere? Anywhere? Anybody using settings here? Um, enabled. Well, we'll just, we'll just make a whole cluster setting for now and we can uh, improve it later to be a session setting and all that. So we're gonna say, um, we're gonna say enable, we'll say var enable uh, distributed index joins equals settings dot bool setting register bool setting this sql wait what is it sql dot this sql dot distributed I guess we could just say distributed join readers, join reader dot enabled. Uh, the description is um, enables an experimental form of experimental way, experimental distribution model for join readers. We don't have to make this too precise because we'll definitely not be committing this all the way for now. The default value is going to be false. Cosmos DB at work? That's cool. How do you like Cosmos DB? I haven't heard too many people using Cosmos DB to be perfectly honest, so I'm curious what it's like. I don't know much about it at all. Enabled distributed dot get DSP dot ST dot SV. I don't really know what Cosmos DB is all about even. Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB. It's a non-relational database. I like how it <laughs> I like how non-relational is actually like a selling point for this Cosmos DB. <laughs> Isn't that so funny that that it's a, it's it's non-relational like relational is such a complicated thing that to define yourself in terms of being the opposite of that is funny to me for some reason. Like I don't know why they don't call it I guess the NoSQL is the same thing, isn't it? I, I hmm. 
I guess I'm surprised they don't just call it like a key value database or something. It's a key value store at, at best. You had a 1.5 terabyte cluster on it. Distributed NoSQL multi-region horizontal scaling with partitions. And each partition is replicated. Multimodal store, but one mode at a time. Interesting. I thought that there was some kind of Cosmos SQL thing, but I guess I must be wrong. Wasn't there something that was... Or maybe it's called like Galaxy DB or something. I don't, I don't remember. Whatever. Um, we had four data... Four terabytes in Cassandra and 90 terabytes in Hadoop, and it was a bad idea. <laughs> but I thought Hadoop and Cassandra were both for big data. Its SQL language is called Core SQL, but it's still no SQL under the hood. Well, that's the same as CockroachDB, right? Each range for Cosmos DB is 20 gigabytes, and there is no cross partition transactions. I see. One magical cluster to solve it all sounds nice, but in practice, means you have an architectural error some way, unless you're CERN and you actually have a data feed that, that that big. One cool story is that when I was in college, I actually got to work for the high energy physics department for University of Chicago, which was in charge. Well, part of the thing that I was working on was they had this big compute cluster for CERN, for the you know large Hadron Collider or whatever. They had this like worldwide network of compute and uh, storage clusters housed at all these different universities. And so my job was to basically for a while to like, I, <laughs> they kept getting huge numbers of these Dell servers in the mail and I would put the Dell servers together and like stick them in racks and stuff like that. And like try to cable them. I was really bad at it. I don't know why they were having me do it. Um, I was just an undergraduate. They should have had somebody who actually knew how to like make the cables all pretty and stuff like that. I definitely was bad at that, but. That was actually pretty cool. And they, they taught me a little bit about the scripts that they used to manage these servers. It was really old school. It's like everything was really, really old school, like Perl everywhere. Um, and that's where they, I guess, part of the spot that they were storing all of the, the, the CERN data in, I guess, at that point. I guess it was pretty much pre-cloud. So it's pretty neat, though. Yeah, they, they had a lot of things, that, a lot of storage requirements. Um, it's pretty heavy, heavy amounts of data there. So we're going to grab this. We're going to set our cluster setting in our test here. Save and OK. Uh, set cluster setting SQL dot to SQL dot. Whoops. SQL dot to SQL dot. What is it? Enable distributed join reader dot enabled. Distributed join reader dot enabled equals true. My experience with Cosmos has not been the best. Maybe I had two high hopes of all the magic that will be handled for me. Yeah, well, I think that's probably true of many, many things that claim to be magic. Um, their multi-region automatic failover is great if a whole region dies, but we had an outage where one of our partitions died, so we were left with no failure and we're dead until it was resolved 30 minutes later. Yikes. Interesting. That is interesting. I mean, that's very different. So multi-region automatic failover. So I guess that's sort of saying that there's a primary secondary setup. Is it like a async replication thing in Cosmos DB? Because in Cockroach DB, <laughs> um, we've got something pretty different. So we, we you can have region failure tolerance that is just about kind of uh, upping the replication factor and using smarter distribution policies so that you can survive a region outage without any kind of failover at all. It's just sort of things are still going to work. Um, but the, the main downside of our solution in Cockroach is that we don't have any kind of two data center replication policy. You, you need at least three um, for the same reason that you need three replicas in a quorum. You can't have two. So a lot of people really want this two data center replication for or active passive kind of thing, but we don't we don't really support that. We only support the full thing, which I guess is more expensive in some cases. Apache Spark for access and processing. Amundsen? I don't know what Amundsen is. What is that? Amundsen? Amundsen database. The open source data catalog? Wow. I have never heard of this. So it's kind of like a... It's like data dictionary stuff, right? Very interesting. Analytic stuff is crazy, man. Analytic stuff is seriously crazy. So let's make sure that this still is looking pretty good. 
it looks like it is looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and add this stuff together. We're going to make a new branch for this. Um, dist join reader git git commit. We're going to say SQL um, add distributed s add um, distribute policy for index joiners. Um, this commit adds an optional distribution policy that uh, plans an index joiner stage next to the data that next to its indexed. Uh, let's see, plans an index joiner stage by, it's kind of hard to describe this by putting an index joiner processor on each node that contains a range, a leaseholder, or a range that is contained, or a range that comprises the uh primary index being joined against um this policy then causes the inputs to the join to the index joiner to be to be routed by range um to be routed I'll just say by range so that the the inputs uh, pre-sort batches of data for the index joiners to join against. Something like this, right? Release note, uh, SQL change, add the SQL.disql. Distributed join reader. Is that what I called it? Dot enabled cluster setting, which controls uh, which controls a new index joiner policy. I don't know if this even needs a release note because we're not going to really merge it, but anyway. Okay, so that's that. The next step would be to adding the vectorized range router and then testing it out. But before that, you guys, I'm going to take a quick bathroom break. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. I feel like... Did you guys hear that? Oh, maybe I, maybe I screwed up my... Uh monitor i didn't hear my own sound but i feel like it did come through to the stream right all right anyway be right back
Hey everyone, I'm back. So, yeah. I feel like the next step is going to be to implement this in the vectorized engine. So it shouldn't be so complicated, I think. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the hash router in the vectorized engine, and we're going to copy it. <laughs> And we're going to make a range router equivalent. So vectorize engine. Um, there's two execution engines in CockroachDB. The row engine, which is a row at a time SQL execution engine, like the volcano model, where you can imagine every processor, like a, a join or a aggregation or a... Um, a projection or any any relational operator is implemented as an iterator where to, in order to do its work it has to ask its input operator for the next row and then do a little bit of work and then it's finished so and then somebody else is going to be asking it for its input so that's kind of the classical sql model and it's pretty simple to reason about um, but it's a little bit underperformant because of various reasons um, of data locality in the in memory as well as having to kind of it's sort of like a little interpreter running the same program over and over and over again per row without any jitting so the vectorize engine is uh it arranges the data in batches and it tries to operate over one to two columns at a time so that all the types are pre-specified and you can write really tight loops that do like if you're doing a projection of adding two columns together. You can write that. That code will be the same as if you were to write a little loop that just add two numbers up. So it's much, much, much faster um, in terms of stuff like that. And it's also faster because of the data, the memory locality of um, uh, the fact that we're storing data in these, these columns. So it's sort of like a semi columnar storage sort of thing, except it's not in storage. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. It's, a, it's just kind of a different representation of the data that we use that's faster. And the reason that we have both the row engine and the execution and the vectorized engine is sort of, it's a bit historical. We want to over time convert everything to live in vectorized and get rid of the row engine. Um, although I, we did, <laughs> we're thinking recently that uh, it's, it's a bit harder to program in the vectorized model. And it's useful to have these tests that verify the behavior that the vectorized engine is the same as the row engine, which is simpler to reason about. So now I've been sort of thinking that maybe we would leave the row engine around just as like a testing oracle, but I, I don't know. We'll see about that. We will see about that. So yeah, um, okay, let's get back into it here. This, I mean, to be honest, this seems like a good amount of code. And I'm thinking that maybe, um, there's also actually even a good, there's a good blog post about it. Maybe vectorize engine. I think there's a good, I think this is a pretty good, pretty good blog post about it. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones. Um, a bunch of other ones. Anyway, uh, yeah, so a little light reading. Uh, I feel like the ideal thing that we could do here is instead of implementing a whole other router, which has all this internal state and all this stuff, don't you think it would be easiest and best if we were to simply have a little internal policy here where it kind of, uh, you created a forum ho post, now you hope for the best. I will do my best to make sure that somebody takes a look at that, Nikon. Sorry you're running into that trouble, by the way. Um. I think what I want to do is make sure that there's a little way that we can configure a policy and the policy is going to be the guy that chooses which route, which stream to write to essentially.
How do we choose? I don't quite understand. Tuple distributor dot distribute. So maybe there is already such a thing. Tuple hash distributor dot distribute. So, and this thing is operating in batch. So that's kind of cool. I wonder if we can have a few of these things. Yohar, are you still there? What do you think about the idea of having a different couple of different types of hash distribu of distributor and then using the same router? I'm not sure how much else of this thing is hashy, you know? It sort of seems like it's all not hashy except for that little distributor algorithm. Except for maybe this. I don't know what this init with hash router means. Oh, it's it's so that it can poke at it or something. But it doesn't seem to need R to be because this this input is an op node and this drain coordinator is a drain coordinator. So yeah, I feel like we could easily uh, make this a bit more general. So we can call this init with router. And then this guy, instead of being a hash router, it could really easily just be wait. How come that? Uh, knit with router. I feel like what we want to do here, just call this a router. And this is in the call flow package and R here is a hash router, but we can make it, we can make a new, uh, Why is this failing to be normal? I don't quite understand it. Why is this failing to be normal? It's going to be clutch for your own project. What's your project that you're working on? Okay. So a drain coordinator. And it kind of seems like what we can do is make a drain coordinator also have, can we just make this a drain coordinator? Or does that not work for some reason? Can we not just make this a drain coordinator? So we can't because this thing has to be an op node, but why don't we just make this guy an op node? Doesn't that solve everything? Certainly looks like it. Okay, so here's my init with router. Um. Router output op. Okay, so that is cool. Fast spreadsheet for in numerical simulations. That does sound cool. That does sound like it could be could be related. I feel like you could also look at pandas. I feel like pandas has got a kind of similar idea. Any any prod, any library that has like data frames, I think they use pretty similar ideas to the vectorize engine, but in a little bit less of a SQL related uh, framing. So 
Right, the whole point of this was what, again? It was so that I could have this hash router, instead of being called hash router, it could just be called router, right? And the key thing is that hash calls, I think the key thing is that hash, why does the hash router have to know its own hash calls? It doesn't, right? It's, it's just about knowing this distribute. And so hash calls is really more like routing calls, right? So what if we called this routing calls? What if we called this routing calls instead of hash calls, huh? And then, and then the, this is the key thing that's going to have to change this tuple distributor. This tuple distributor is going to change. And uh huh. So if it's not a by hash, then we quit. And then the key thing is here that we would create a different distributor depending on the thing that we're doing. So why don't we try this out? I don't know if it's going to work out, but we'll see. So the other thing that we need to do is say switch output dot type case exec infra pb exec infra pb dot by hash by hash uh, okay so we'll go like this um And then I think there was one other spot where we didn't support it, right? By hash over here. Oh wait, no, that was the one that we just edited. I think this one. Pass through by hash by range. Exec in for pb dot by range. unsupported router similarities with your computation engine since the goal is to take formulas and JIT compile them to operate on n dimensional arrays yes it definitely does seem similar Oakley doke. So here's my is supported change. And the next step, right, the next step is going to be coming back up to here and choosing my distributor. So how are we going to do this exactly? New hash router. New hash router with outputs. Where where do we make our new tuple hash distributor? This is like the key thing that we're just gonna have to pull out, I guess. So I think what we can do is we just have it be passed into this. I don't know. It's a little weird. It's a little weird. Call exec, there's call exec hash. I think for this, why don't we just I don't think we need it to live in any kind of hash zone but you know what we do need though i think that the index join dot eg dot go file i think this did have something that we needed to borrow um right constructing spans
span assembler dot consume batch. This this whole thing. Call exec span. It lives in call exec span. That's nice. Utility operator that generates a series of spans from input batches, which can be used to perform an index join. So I think we need to instantiate one of these guys in this thing that we're building. So perhaps we would want to live it created in call exec span. I feel like that would be a nice thing. This one's in call exec hash. This one's in call exec span. I feel like that seems good. See you later, Nikon. Thanks for stopping by. Um, yeah, hope you get a response on that thing. And I hope it resolves more importantly. <laughs> so we're going to make a tuple hash distributor. We're going to make a tuple range distributor, maybe. So these are going to be called routing calls. I guess we can leave them as hash calls, but I think what we do need to do is create an interface out of this thing. So let's make an interface. So we're going to have guess we need all of these. I don't know. Reset num outputs. Uh, it's going to be called tuple distributor to directory. It's so whatever this vectorized flow thing is in. I can't remember. We'll just leave it in hash utils for now. What's up, Robin? Thanks for lurking. So here's our tuple distributor. And we're going to leave it in this call flow, I think. So we're going to make it, put it over here, maybe. So tuple distributor is an interface that this needs to be called routing calls. Um, a tu tuple distributor um, distributes. Um, I'll just grab this. So tuple distributor distributes tuples from batches according to a policy based on the values in the routing calls of each tuple in the batch. The distribution, I guess I'll just copy that sentence as well. The distribution occurs by populating selection vectors, which the caller needs to use accordingly. Okay, so According to the routing calls. Okay. And what is this reset num outputs about? All right. So here is our shiny tuple distributor. And I think that this can actually be, doesn't have to be exported 
really. Okay, so I guess the next thing is now we're going to implement this guy in our call exec span uh, code here. So we can put it in a new file called range distributor, basically. Um, so we're going to make an interface implementation of tuple distributor. For some reason, this doesn't exist. Don't quite know why. Hey, Soy Pete, thank you so much for the raid, and thanks for all the the nice shout outs on Twitch and on uh, Twitter um, as well. I hope you had a great stream. What did you work on? So we're going to say type range distributor struct people distributor streams of the streams. So we'll, we'll say range distributor is a tuple distributor. I guess we'll say it's a call flow. Call flow dot people distributor that distributes tuples based on a preset on a preset mapping of keys. Uh, how do I say this? Based on a preset mapping of spans to nodes, each um, uh, a key keys are assembled by encoding the values at each routing call in each tuple. I guess it's we'll, we'll say um, I guess I'll just say keys are assembled from the values that each routing call call value in each tuple. Um, and these keys are located within the span mapping. Um, this range distributor is used to implement the range router type. I guess I'll just say implement the range range. Uh, I guess it's the by by range routing policy for dist SQL. How about that as a comment? Okay, so um, let's go ahead and see what we have to do to build one of these guys. We make a cancel checker. Why don't we just, just copy everything out of here to see what of it we need. We don't need an init hash value. We don't need buckets. We do need these selection vectors. We do need a cancel checker. Overload helper, I don't know. Data malloc, I don't know either. So for init, we're going to say these all need to be pointer receivers. We're going to say r dot cancel checker dot init of ctx. Reset num outputs. Now that, that I do not know, frankly. I guess I probably just will copy this whole thing. This is a little awkward. This makes it feel like, well, this should be shared, huh? This should definitely be shared. So maybe we need to have a base 
little sad. It's certainly a little sad. When does this even get called? Just one time. Oh, it's also for... Hmm. Maybe I don't need to put this in the interface then. I'm going to get rid of this one from the interface. We're just going to have init and distribute. Okay, so next up... We're going to get rid of this. And how do we implement distribute? That's the next question. So let's take a look at how the original one is implemented. We'll just copy the whole implementation again and pick about pick out what we like from it. So we don't have any buckets. Do we need a datum alloc? I don't understand that. I mean, ultimately what we need to do is we need to initialize one of these things in the index joiner, which is called a span assembler. So we definitely need a span assembler. I feel like I'm assembling things. I feel like I'm a factory worker right now. So we're gonna have a span assembler And our call span assembler, what does this thing do? It's assembler dot consume batch. What does this do? It generates lookup spans from input batches and stores them to later be retrieved. Spans are only generated for rows in the range start to end IDX. And why are these spans exactly and not keys? I guess we can assume that the spans for index join are singular, but that's a little bit sketchy, right? So we'll start by just passing in our batch and our start IDX is zero and our end IDX is B dot length, I think. Then we're gonna say r.assembler.get spans. We're gonna get our spans and then, are these in order? These should be like in order or something, right? I think they're, I think they start out in order. And then basically what we do So we're going to say spans is equal to assembler.getspans. I don't know what this is about. This doesn't seem necessary. Do something with our selection vectors. Build a selection vector for each output. So essentially what we need to do here is for each span, we need to look up in which we need to search for it. So I think what we can do is grab the implementation from the row-based one now. So we can look for <clears throat> range router. And what it does is what? Compute destination. Oh, this is our hash router. Where's our range router? Span for data. Compute destination. So it creates this, which we've already done, and then span for data is doing what? It does a sort.search. Uh, so let's just let's just grab this implementation here and see how it does for us. Um, so essentially what we need to do is I need to say like for i in range spans. We need to say 
Yeah, we need to we need to get these these spans here. We need to grab this. And we may even need I'm not sure if we need this common coding. I don't think we do, but I think we do need this and I think we also do need this. So we're going to grab these things over here. And we're going to stick them in the range distributor. And we're going to be comparing to the spans of I dot E. And I think we need to also assert um, if spans of I dot end key is not equal to nil, I think we need to like throw an error here. If this is the len of this thing is not equal to zero, let's just panic for now. Um, unexpectedly trying to range route a non point span. So we'll just get rid of that case. And this I here is going to be the I'll call this IDX. Okay. And then there's this weird thing about selection vector. And I guess the idea is that we want I actually, I guess we actually need to do, we kind of need to, ooh, this is tricky. I'm actually a little confused. So, so when I run my span assembler, is this thing ignoring the selection vector or is it using the selection vector? I guess we have to look, get spans. Span encoders dot next. So it looks like this does not ignore the selection vector, obviously. But then the question is, does it? Then it returns op.outputbytes. And then we just. I don't really get this. I'm a bit confused here. So we run through each of the encoders. And then we. Bonk Donculus. What's up, buddy? Okay, so I think this thing like deselects essentially. I think the, the selection is all gone after the index join is finished, which presents a bit of a problem, I want to say. Um, because we have to re. Or does it? Maybe it's actually kind of simple. Shout out to that Ergo keyboard. Heck yes. <laughs> so I think that what we do here
I'm working on the, this is the, a little algorithm for distributing SQL rows based on the range of data that they live inside of. Um, it's kind of in the name of implementing this little picture here in a different model. So the idea here is that we read a bunch of data from a secondary index here, and then we distribute the lookup of the primary part of that same row to the nodes that we know are going to contain that particular primary chunk. So it's sort of like pre-partitioning the looking up so that all of the lookups can be local. That's the idea. Previously, we did this in a slightly different way. And my hypothesis is that this should be a bit faster, but I'm not sh completely sure that that's true. But we will find out. We will find out. So we, for each of the spans, we check its index. And then we just need to figure out how do we like populate the selection vector, right? What is this output IDX? Output IDX is equal to buckets of I. I think what we need to do is, eh, it's a little bit confusing. So figuring out how to shard data between nodes such that when you join all the data will be on a single node. It's kind of, yeah, it's basically figuring out how to shard data. It's kind of, instead of sharding data, we're not really sharding data, we're really sharding the computation and the computation was already sharded. This is just sharding it in a slightly different way. If I do a select where X in X through one, that one through a thousand, would it not do some smart batching of the lookups? So I think in, in that particular case, we don't do That's not a, we're not going to plan a join in that particular case. I think we're just going to plan a big, um, I mean, we can find out what we do. Um, explain select star from a where a in so yeah I mean in, in if if it does if you keep like a sequential set of numbers here I'm not sure if that was the kind of example you're looking for but if you do put a sequential in it will just big make a big span and look it up all at once I feel I'm getting the sense that this is probably not the question you were asking though um, before this change, yeah, if you use random keys, I mean, if you use random keys, the thing is, it's still going to just emit a bunch of, a bunch of pre-calculated spans, um, so that we don't have to do anything complicated because all of the spans are pre-calculated. Like I, I know what those values are at query plan time. The, the, this thing is all about not knowing what the values are that we're looking up at query plan time. It's dynamic. So based on the data in the table. That's what's telling us wh which node to go to. Um, and previously, we chose which node to go to on the same node that we got the particular piece of data from. So, like, you get a you get a piece of data from this thing on the on the left, and you're going to choose which node to go to. You're gonna you're gonna take a batch of a thousand. You're gonna send out one batch per node um, to fill up that one thousand. Whereas in this particular case, what we're doing is slightly different. We're sort of on demand, dynamically sending the lookup key to the node that we know is going to have the result. And then we're continuing the computation on that node. So we don't have to go back. That's kind of the main thing. Instead of having to do, we're, we're doing less round trips or fewer round trips as a result. We're, we're kind of transforming this round trip modality where we have to make these little batches and send them out and get them back and then continue to a, a modality where we're building up a big batch, pushing it to where we know the data is going to be living and then continuing the computation for those tuples on that node. 
So it's more of a graph computation model than a round trip RPC model using this method. Does that make sense? So I think what we do here is that we need to say, we need to get rid of this. I, th I guess what we could do is we could build up another slice of these indexes or something like that. You need to understand the problem before you can understand the solution. I'm not sure if I'm gonna satisfactorily describe the problem because it's a little bit subtle. It's a little bit subtle. Let me let me try to explain one more way. So here's this, imagine this view. And then let me let me give you what it looks like without this setting turned on. So um, let me go over here to my dist, whoops, disk join reader. Whoops, why does it not complete to that properly? Disk join reader. So if I turn this setting off and then I run the test again. Uh oh, it might not compile now. Uh, one second. Okay, so I'll try it one more time to get the way that plan looked before this idea. So before this idea, the plan looks like this, a much simpler plan. Um, but the, the, the reason that this plan looks so simple is a little bit subtle. It's because it's hiding the fact that each of these join reader processors, they individually have to send out little batches, RPC batches to some random node in the cluster, including nodes four and five, which are not even represented in this picture. So you can imagine instead of this nice, clear looking graph, we have like a bunch of RPCs here and then a bunch of RPCs here that are all jumbled up. Like node three is going to be requesting data from nodes one through five. Node two is going to be requesting data from nodes one through five. And it's this big, really heavy, like back and forth kind of RPC jumble. It's just not visible here. And the trick is that it's actually an RPC. So it's sending to that remote node, it's getting data and it's getting it back, then continuing its work. Um, whereas this view, it looks more complicated, but it's simpler because the RPCs only go in one direction. We're pushing the queries out. These nodes satisfy the queries and then continue their work on the very same spot. So it's like, I almost think that it's like having the network bandwidth or maybe even better because not only are we doing fewer round trips. It's a one directional round trip instead of a two directional round trip. The batches are also fuller because of this property that we, we don't like withhold a batch until it's full sized in the, in this old model, in, in this model over here, we, we just send it out as soon as we have it. So let's say in this case, we had to send one tuple to node one and one tuple and, and then a thousand tuples to node five or whatever, that would be like one little tiny mini batch and one big batch. Um, whereas in this model, we can withhold data until the batch is nice and full before we push it out. So it's, you know, more efficient, I think. It's still a hypothesis because I haven't finished the work. So coming back to this code here, we need to finish this little selection vector algorithm to make this work. So how does this work again? We're going through our selection vector. And the key is that I think what I should probably do is just Pull this guy down. Um, or should I just build this up into another slice? Let's just build this up into another slice for now. So we're going to say um, output IDXs is equal to make int len spans and i think we could cache this later but we'll do that later so then we're going to say output idx's of i is equal to idx this needs to be idx not i 
Okay, so we populate this little output IDX's slice, and then when we iterate through our selection vector, um, we're going to get the output IDX from our output IDX's array. And then we can say this thing, this, this is looking very similar to the other one, but whatever. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The the, the new approach, instead of, you can think of it this way. The old path, it has to send data to nodes and then the nodes do some work and then it gets some data back and then it continues it work, its work. In the new model, um, this th these lines here, this is the representation of sending data to nodes, but it never has to get data back from the nodes. That's the key thing. Um, it sends these queries to the nodes and then instead of these nodes having to send that data back, um, it's doing it locally every time. So that's kind of the, the trick. Nodes only push. Yeah, that's exactly the idea. It's a push only model. Exactly, 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 exactly. I should have said that. I should have just said, this is making it push only instead of push and push and, uh, push and pull. Sounds asynchronous. It is asynchronous, Tesla Motors. How do they know which node needs what data to push? Ah, great question. So the reason that they can know is this little orange box here that says by range. Um, and what by range means, exactly. But what by range means is that given a key, so CockroachDB is a SQL database written on top of a KV uh, map, basically. And given a key in this KV map, we have a cache called the range cache that tells us what range, what data range um, a particular key is living in. A data range is just a chunk of data. And each of the data ranges um, have a replication group, a raft replication group. And each of those raft replication groups has a leaseholder. And the leaseholder is a node. And the node of the leaseholder is the node that you have to read data from. So the idea is that if I know the range for a particular key, then I know the leaseholder for that range. And if I know the leaseholder, then I know the node. And if I know the node, then I can push data all the time to the particular node that owns that data. So reads scale linearly. You could say that, you could say that. Thank you for the 100 bits anonymous cheer, by the way. Okay. Okay, so interesting that we don't need these routing calls here. And the reason for that is that our assembler has to already have known the routing calls, I think. But we'll just hide this for now. Thank you for the 11 months, Lithium. Really appreciate all of that support. A promise ring. <laughs> yes, that would be great. I love promise rings. Clears up what I mean by sharding the computation. Okay. So I guess the next thing is that we're going to need to construct this range distributor. I think this thing is probably correct ish. And so the next step would be actually, I have to construct one of the, these things in the initialization phase of the hash router over here. So I guess this this should really be called, it should really just be called new router, honestly. I'm frustrated by that. Um, on the other hand, I, I suppose I could, I just feel like all of this setup is really gonna be exactly the same. Really, it's like all exactly the same except for this. So I, I think I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it. It's a little sad because I feel like it's now gonna be confusing because there's gonna be almost nothing called a hash router. It's all just gonna be called router. 
but it just, I don't see a great way around it. So we're gonna just call this new, new router. A new router that contain, consumes call data about batches from input and and distributes each row according to routing calls to one of the outputs returned as operators. Glorious future ahead. Exactly. Exactly. So this is going to be called routing calls. Um, allocators, blah, blah, blah. So this is now going to return just going to change this whole thing to be router. Wow. Boing. <laughs> I guess what we're just going to say router computes a destination for each row. These destinations are exposed as operators. Returned by the constructor. It should say a little bit more. Computes a destination for each row. I guess that's really... I'll just leave it as that, honestly. Okay, so we have our new router. We have our routing calls. Then the next thing, we're going to change this one. New router with outputs. Let's call these our routing calls as well. And then the last thing is that we just simply have to pass this. Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. The tuple distributor. This thing needs to be included as a parameter now. So we're going to pull this out into a variable. And instead of declaring it here, we're going to actually simply include it as a parameter. So tuple distributor. And this is going to be a tuple distributor, which is from the... Oh, did I put it in the wrong package? No, I don't think I did. Okay, and then this guy needs to also be a... Just a tuple distributor, like so. And this guy needs to be a... This guy needs to accept a tuple distributor. tuple distributor and this tuple distributor is going to be passed in as a parameter as well and i suppose in that case we don't even need no we do need the routing calls it's a little unusual why do we need the routing calls the routing calls should really exist as part of the distrib oh i see so according to the hash i mean we could change this honestly because the hash distributor i guess it Honestly, it, it feels like it should just know the hash calls at initialization time. It's slightly odd to be passed in each time. But whatever, I'm just going to ignore that. Um, and we'll just do both for now. So routing calls, tuple distributor. Okay. Very good. And then the last step is going to be changing the new router to accept the tuple distributor next to the hash columns, which are no longer gonna be hash columns at all. So here's a bunch of crap that needs to be fixed. Hash router needs to become, uh, does this thing have a stringer, I wonder? Um, output router spec by hash. It does indeed have a stringer. So that's kind of cool. So why don't we just say mm name is equal to format.sprintf s router S and the S is going to be our output dot type. And then this is going to be our strings dot join. JB Pratt, 
Hello. So here is our memory monitor name. And router.run log tags dot add. Why don't we just call this router ID? Seems simpler. Well, we'll make it, we'll make it, uh, look like this. Okay. Great. So then we simply need to extend this switch statement. So here's going to, we're going to be distributor distributor is equal to, we'll say var distributor. That is going on uh, tuple distributor. Okay. Let's say, so in the case of by range, we're going to use the old code that we had, which was, this is called dependency injection. You guys ever heard of it? This is called dependency injection. We gotta love it. We gotta love it. You don't need to have a big framework like juice or spring to do dependency injection. All you have to do is whatever the heck we're doing right now. That's the only thing. So our distributor is going to look like this. Now we need to know the length of our outputs. Now, what is that about exactly? What is that about? I think the length of the unlimited allocators. All right, sure. So what is that exactly meaning though? Unlimited allocators. It's basically the length of our outputs dot streams. Okay, fine. So length of our output dot streams. So, and now our, our by range distributor, on the other hand, is going to be slightly different. It's going to be a new tuple span distributor, we're calling it. Well, this is just called range distributor. Honestly, I, th I feel like it should just be called new range distributor. Well, we'll call it tuple range distributor just for evenness. Tuple range distributor. Context reminds me of context from initial props. Does Go and React have similar vocabulary? Context in Go is um, a bit different from props. We, we don't usually use context to pass that kind of data that you would, I mean, props is almost used as an arguments field in React, if I understand correctly. And I think in, in Go context is used for, it's almost used for like side channel things like cancellation of work or log tags or things of that nature. So I think it's a bit different. Um, I guess context is just a, a word that a lot of people use. So let's make a new funk funk new tuple range distributor. It's going to return a tuple range distributor. Maybe it'll return a pointer to one actually. And right. So the question now is what do we need to pass in here? We need to create a call span assembler, which needs all of this stuff. So we probably need to make, make that up here in the new field. And that means we're going to need a codec it probably needs, we're just going to need to have all of this crap. So we might as well bite the bullet. So 
it's kind of a lot of info. I'm not sure if we're gonna we really easily have all this info, actually. It's a bit concerning. Yeah, it's quite concerning. We don't have all this information. <clears throat> Oh, and the reason is that, again, it's this, ah, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit different. Because the, 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 the thing is that in the row engine, we don't use the, the key prefix. We don't create the key prefix. And actually, it becomes a quite a bit simpler if we don't have that, doesn't it? So why don't we just make this optional? Why don't we just make another new call span assembler that doesn't use this prefix? So we're gonna we're gonna make another new call span assembler. So we'll call this one. Well, oh, this is also a generated file. So it's span assembler template. <clears throat> so I think what we're gonna do is keep this one. We're gonna rename this one to be new call span assembler without prefix. Without table prefix. So we're going to get rid of these things. Oh, but we do we still need this call fam start keys stuff? Two lists of keys of the same length. Hmm, this is actually a bit a bit tricky. And I think that my, I'm guessing that this code that I've written so far is probably not gonna work in the presence of column families, is it? And it's actually making me wonder. It's making me wonder a bit. But it, maybe it's fine. What's up, Ginny Pie? Do I map stuff out on paper when hitting tricky problems? Um, sometimes. I think in this case, it's not that kind of problem. I feel like I do that when there's like a tricky algorithms problem. Um, sometimes. But definitely not in every case. This case is sort of more just like crap. I forgot something. Um, like. I think the main issue is, um, what is the main issue anyway? Let's take a look at the commit we made. Didn't I have some panic somewhere? I didn't. That's actually only in the new case, I see. So ultimately the problem, the problem is that we, what is the problem? I'm a bit confused. Okay, so let's take a look at the original thing. Here's our range router. Here's our spans. When we compute, when we compute our destination, you see this in code. Span for data. Span for data actually gives me back, it just has a key. It doesn't have a span. What does this mean? What does this mean? CockroachDB does have several special SQL features. Yes, it's, they're mostly around multi-region data distribution. 
probably some other ones too, but those ones are really big. Multi-region features are all are very neat. Let me send it to you. Okay. Cockroach DB multi-region. Take a look at this. This is some neat stuff. Definitely some neat stuff. You got restore to work. You deleted the backup statistics file in the backup folder. That is weird. That is deeply weird. I don't, I have no idea what that might mean. So you deleted it and then you reran it and then it was really fast. Sounds like a bug report. <laughs> Definitely sounds like a bug report. Huh. That is bizarre. I've never heard of that. Five minutes. That's really fast. Huh. So I think that, yeah, hopefully, I, I think that the thing that I'm struggling with here is that, so column families is a way to split a row across multiple keys. And typically when we're creating spans, we need to make sure that we include both of the keys in the span to look up both of those column families. But this range router stuff is a bit different. It's different because it doesn't actually have to create the span for any good reason. It's really just to, to like look up which spot it should send to. So like that, uh, <laughs> If the return lists are empty, the spans cannot be split into separate family spans. I guess all I, all I, maybe all I have to do is just set these things to be nil, and then that's actually all I need to do. Okay, let's just try that. <laughs> no, that's okay, Nikon. I appreciate your bug reports always. So I'm basically working on making this graph a reality. This graph is a way in which we're distributing a join in a slightly different way than we normally do. This is what we normally do. This is what we're trying to do. And it looks more complicated, but it's actually more efficient. That's that's the idea. <clears throat> so what we do here is we get rid of our key prefix. We don't have any scratch key. And our length, and I think I think the idea is that our length of key prefix is zero. So this also goes away and our allocator remain remains. Um, right. So the only issue is that I actually need all those lines because they need to remain on the other. I actually just, I should probably just, okay. How do I do this? I, I keep this whole definition. I copy it over here. Um, and I close it, I get rid of this without. It's not a REST API, no. It's um, it's a, just a sort of Postgres compatible RPC interface, like a SQL connection interface. So we're gonna grab all this stuff and we're gonna stick it up here. Then we're gonna get rid of these things And then we're going to call we're going to assembler is equal to new call span assembler without table prefix codec allocator um let me pass in input types needed calls 
Okay, then we can say base is equal to assembler assembler dot. Oh, does this return? It's annoying. I guess we can just cast it for now. Span assembler. Oh, but the type, uh, it depends on the type. Ooh, that's tricky. Okay. Um, hmm. I guess we could break this little guy out on its own. So we'll just call this new call span assembler base. Call span assembler base. or span assembler base. Okay, and so then we're gonna grab all of this stuff here. We're gonna return base. And then we're gonna say base is equal to new call span assembler base, codec, allocator, input types, needed calls. And we're gonna grab this stuff up here Put it here. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, it generates <laughs> it generates um, spans it generates uh, key spans without the table index prefix that make them actually valid for lookups um, and can't be used without, yeah. I don't know. It's a little bit weird. And this thing is always gonna be, it's always gonna be no, it's always gonna look like this. And so in that case, we can also collapse this guy. Um, although that looks kind of gross. We'll keep it like this. So you're modifying the default join feature by creating a new join function or DB interconnection query that accepts. Not really. It's, it's kind of like, it's more like we're changing the it's very internal. So you, you wouldn't really be able to notice as a user, except for performance, hopefully. Um, but basically certain kinds of joins will be more efficient. <laughs> that That's the idea. It's, it's a different way of distributing the joint. Like imagine you're writing a distributed, I don't know, distributed computation graph. Um, this is like a slightly different way of arranging that distributed computation graph such that it's more efficient. Hopefully, hopefully. All right. So now that we've done this, 
now that we've done this, um, I think what we need to do is run. So we need to say new call span assembler. Oh, well, I guess first we've got to run make exec gen or something. Okay, so now that we've run make exec gen, the new file will be available available without table prefix. We're going to pass in codec, allocator, input types, needed calls. Okay, now we are talking. And then we can say distributor is equal to tuple range distributor. Assembler will be this guy. I mean, honestly, I think we just return this, right? Because what, what else do we actually have to populate? I guess we need to get this cancel checker in, right? Um, how do we make this cancel checker? Or do we just sort of pull it out from thin air? It looks like we sort of pull it out from thin air. The only thing that we actually populate is this selection vector thing. So we can go ahead and do that. Num outputs. Where is num outputs coming from? Over here. Oh, it's this len streams thing. So I guess we'll say num outputs. And like so. Then we just got to pass in these other these other arguments. So we've got to pass in our codec. So that's going to be flow context dot codec. Our allocator. Do we have an allocator here? We may not. Where do we get our allocator from? Looks like we create one from scratch in this case. So I guess we can do the same thing, right? Okay. Why do we wait a minute? Why do we have this? Okay, well, whatever. So that's that. This is that uh, mem monitor dot make bound account allocator is equal to new allocator. Okay. So then we have our input types which hopefully we have around. We only have our output types right now, which is a bit of a bummer. How do we get our input types exactly? Our input types might be the same as our output types in this case, right? I feel like they are exactly the same. Yeah, they're definitely the same. So our output types are the same as our input types. Um, our needed columns, what is our needed columns going to be? So our needed columns are essentially our, they're our, needed columns. I feel like our needed columns, it's, that's only for thinking about the oh crap I did something a little bit wrong here I need to get the the key column directions here <clears throat> so to do that I 
I suppose since we don't want to be passing in the index, we'll need to be passing in something else. Which would be, I mean, we actually have this information in the router spec, right? We, we kind of have it just sitting around over here, right? We have it because we have output dot range router spec dot all of this crap. I mean, we need to find a way to pass all of this crap in, by the way. So part of it is this encodings thing and encodings, it has an index of a column to encode. So right, this is how we're gonna get all of this stuff. So we let's, let's start by parsing this stuff apart. Um, I suppose we could just, we could just pass that in all together. So why don't we start by just passing that in all together? Output dot range router spec dot encodings. Thank you for the 101 bits anonymous. See you later, Tesla. Thanks for stopping by. So instead of needed calls, we're just going to go ahead and pass in our encodings. They're going to be exec infra pb dot range router spec column encoding like this. Okay, so then at this point, what we need to do is construct our needed calls from the column encoding. So we need to say um, for i in range. Oh, wait, no, but the needed calls are something else, right? We need to remember the needed calls, I think, are actually about creating column families. And so they're not actually necessary for the base thing. So let's actually just get rid of that altogether. So we've got to do it in the template. So I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to get rid of this. <clears throat> We're going to get rid of this. So then the last thing that we do need to figure out, though, is how to represent this stuff. How are we going to do that? I think we just want to pass in a slice of index descriptor ascending or descending. I think that would be the most straightforward thing to do here. It's a little gross because it means that we're going to have to do more work in the other case, but I think it's fine. So we're going to pass in also a slice of desk pb dot index descriptor direction. Um, and this is going to be called the it's going to be called the key directions key in encoding directions. How about that? So this is going to be for i is equal to zero, i less than, I guess let's preserve this code and put it up in the other case. So key encoding directions is equal to b, or it's key. make, um, desk pb dot direction len or it's just going to be index dot num key columns and then we do this little loop and we say key ank directions of i is equal to index dot get key column direction of i and then we get rid of this stuff and we send this in over here key ank directions all right so now now, for i in range key ank directions, 
your first official contribution to the Go repo? That is awesome, dude. What did you what did you do? That's amazing. You got to send the CL, send the CL. Had to sign CLA to fix go blog websites, hamburger menu. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Now that is a contribution. Okay. So we're going to pass in our e ink directions here. e ink directions, desk PB direction. jQuery, old school, old school. Okay, so let's rerun our make exec gen. Some badass dudes thanked you, that is awesome. No, it's a big deal. Any contribution is a big deal because it means that nobody had to do that. You helped, you did a thing, I'm proud of you. Okay, so key ink directions is equal to make uh, desk pb dot index descriptor direction len encodings key ink directions of i is equal to right. So this is this thing where you've got to translate. <clears throat> we'll say if encodings of i dot Encoding is equal to SQL base dot datum encoding ascending key. I guess we can say switch case roach or task pb dot index. And then we're going to do one for a descending key. And this is going to be desk. And then finally, we'll have default panic unsupported encoding direction plus encodings of I dot coding. Keen to be a contributor for open fast. They are doing crazy stuff. Serverless without vendor lock in. That does sound really cool. All right, so we've got our little e ink directions and we can pass them in like this. Okay. Okay, so this is good. This is very good stuff. Is this all we need? Is this all we need? I do not believe this is quite all we need because what we need also we need to instruct this call span assembler as to the correct yeah where is that done i'm confused about where this is done we need to know which index within the batches to be encoding and i don't see where that's done right now Where is that done right now? Where do these span encoders get cre created? This is the question. Consume batch. Where do these span encoders get created? Input types of I and I. So I. Oh, do they have to be in order? Well, that would be a major problem. This would be a major problem. 
if we needed to always have I be I think that we need to pass in a different I here. This is getting more and more complicated. So we also need to pass in a slice of, oops, need to pass in a slice of um, E ordinals int, dang it, I always hate having a, an, a, an ordinal array, it's never good, um, it's never good. So we'll say key ordinals if non-nil. is a slice that represents the indexes. Oh, it's going great, Sora. We've made huge progress. We have this very pretty picture and we are working on implementing the range router inside of the vectorize engine. And after that's done, we'll be finished. It's a slice that represents the indexes, the ordinals within the input batches to encode the ith element of key ordinals is the location is the column ordinal at which to find the ith element of each key to construct. Okay, so we're passing this thing in. Then what we've got to do is pass this also in to E ordinals. And this has got to have the same thing. And then over here, basically, we're just going to say if key ordinals is not equal to nil. Say idx is equal to i, idx is equal to key ordinals of i. All right, well, I don't, I hate this, but you know, it's fine. Then here we'll pass in nil all ordinals or key ordinals rather, key ordinals. Okay. So then the next step is over here we've got to pass in the correct ordinals when we call, well, first we've got to run make exec gen again. Do you think passing functions inside maps as parameters like funk pipeline Funk pipeline maps to functions is a code smell. I don't know. It probably depends on what you're doing. Um, so the key ordinals. So we're gonna make our key ordinals now. Key ordinals is equal to make int len encodings. And we're gonna say key ordinals of i equal to encodings of i dot column okay so at this point i think we should be good to go to be honest i think we should be good to go actually crazy enough i'm sure i'm missing something i've got to pass in my tuple distributor here comes after my routing calls Now, what is this about? Why do I have to even have this?
I guess it's just kind of a, uh, a bit confusing, but it just is fine. Um, note, we always pass the hash columns into, we should just refactor this honestly, but I don't, don't want to. Or maybe it's worth it. Should I just quickly, quickly refactor this? Um, maybe I should just quickly refactor this. It shouldn't be so bad, actually. So inside of the new tuple hash distributor, we're going to also pass in output.hash columns. This thing is going to also take a int hash columns. I guess it's a uint32. So then we're going to say hash columns, hash columns. All right, so then when we come down to this guy, we don't even need to pass these hash calls anymore. We just uh, we just use our b.hash calls. This is actually a lot more elegant. Or our d.hash calls. No? Hash columns. Hash columns. I think this is a lot more elegant, to be honest. Um, and so then we can get rid of our routing calls altogether. And we get rid of this. And we get rid of this. We get rid of this. We get rid of this. This is going to be clean, according to a policy. According to the policy in the past in tuple distributor. Okay, now this is getting nice and clean. Nice and clean. And this goes away. Oh yeah, now that is really clean. Okay. So this is troublesome because why? Oh, it's because of this. Get rid of this. All right, so let's go ahead and make our test. <laughs> no chance, this works. Oh wait, we've got to we've got to re-enable the uh, the cluster setting. Join dist join reader dist join reader. Doesn't force anyone to do confluence talks. Uh oh, okay, what's wrong with this? Hash based partitioner. Fit in peculiar? I can try to do that. 100%. Okay, so this now. Oh crap, I forgot about this as an issue. Don't tell me this changes. I don't think it does. I think we're fine. Thank goodness. Okay, this does not change. Okay, thank goodness. I, I think this is fine. I think we can just pass in. Uh, dot hash calls uh, it does change crap okay this is not good it 
It can be different from hash calls one in the case of the external hash joiner. Oof, this is annoying. Um, dang it. Here I thought everything was fine. Um, I guess I could just make two hash distributors. Uh, wait, hash calls is the, these ones, right? This is hash calls. I see. So I suppose I could, I could just do it right here. Wait, where's this? Where do we make this distributor guy? Oh, I see. So basically we'll just make. We'll just kind of do like this here. And so we're going to say for I in range op dot hash calls. We'll say op dot tuple distributor is equal to make op dot tuple, whoops, make hash distributor. Okay, so how about this? So let's change this to be Google distributors. And then this needs to be distributors of input idx.distribute. Then we can get rid of this. All right. That's not so bad. Uh-oh. Uh, do I have an input idx here? Oh, presumably it's I, right? Yeah, it's just, oh, I see. There's just two inputs. So do I, I guess I do it to all of them. Well, uh, <laughs> hopefully this is fine. Uh, okay. All right, well, this is good. Unlimited, unexpected leftover bytes. That simply means that we are fools. Didn't clean up our own memory accounts, um, which is sort of expected in this case because we didn't really clean anything. Um, now, how exactly are we ordinarily solving this? Presumably the router has a close, right? Some sort of close here. Where do we, let's see. 
Where do we close this guy, for example? Mm, guess it's not here. I think it probably means that I didn't, I didn't close this guy somewhere. It's my guess. And I, I'm trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be closing these accounts that I've opened, which I think makes sense that I, I didn't do that, right? I could be wrong. I don't think I need this, do I? Get rid of this. I don't think I need this, do I? Get rid of this. This I think I can delete. Well, we'll keep that around in case I don't I need it for later. But yeah, I mean basically like I think what's going wrong here is that But I think that I'm not I'm not getting I'm not getting I'm not accumulating this thing properly. I'm like 90% sure, right? I'm just it comes from the ether and then I don't close it down. I think I need to like pass it into some sort of list somewhere. But I'm not sure where that goes. Yeah, I have no idea. I suppose I could maybe, maybe there's a way to like, is there some kind of like default allocator that I have? New streaming mem account. New streaming mem account. From what? Where does that live? New streaming mem account. That lives in the vectorized flow creator. I see. I get a new memory account bound to the monitor in flow context. Okay, try that. <laughs> I do still feel like I'm not. Newly created account to S.Accounts. accounts. That sounds a bit more good. Okay. I forgot about the old S dot account. So we're going to say like this. Okay. So this is a more severe issue. Unexpectedly trying to range route a non-point span. That is a true problem. And I think that what way we solve it is in our tuple range distributor, we just chop down these spans and turn them into, we basically just, we cheat. We just say spans of I dot. Actually, I don't think we even need to do this. I think we can just get rid of this altogether. We'll try again. Peculiar. I don't can't forget about peculiar. Index out of range minus one. Okay, so the issue here is this guy. Basically, it couldn't find a span. So I think what we should do here to debug is print out um, format.println found a span spans of i. And we're going to say format.println searching through spans. And we're going to print out r.spans 
dot. Oh crap, this is this dumb thing where we don't really have, yeah, it's these guys. Oh, I still think, I think that we still have a bad prefix here. I think that we're not supposed to have any prefix. Let me just double check. I think that we shouldn't, oh no, I guess we should. Yeah, okay, that's actually correct. So let's print out what we're what we're creating then. Get rid of rewrite for now. Okay, so in this case We're getting found a span one ninety eight and ninety. I mean, these look fine. I think it's. Do you think it's this end span stuff? It doesn't look like it is related to this end span stuff because we're not even looking at the end spans of our spans. Let's just, we'll, we'll just delete this um, for the purposes of debugging. Whoops, is equal to nil. So this looks Fine. And so now I'm confused why this should be wrong. Let's actually, okay, let's go back to our Let's disable the range router from vectorized for a second. So we'll disable this one from vectorized and we're gonna print out in our range router on the row engine what we're getting here. So searching for span and we're going to print out roach pb dot e of data So what we get is looking like this. And these look perfectly normal and the same as what they did before, right? Just table and then the number. These look like table and then the number. So this is looking fine. So what the heck is my question? And these are now looking like table 400 through 500. Perhaps it means that I'm just misconstructing this the spans to search for, search through. Perhaps I'm just not even constructing them at all. <laughs> Is it something as dumb as that? It's probably something really stupid like that. R dot spans. Am I constructing this ever? No, I'm not constructing this. Oh, I, no, I'm not. I'm never writing to this thing. Okay, so it's just that I didn't initialize this stupid thing properly. Okay, so there's a slight, slight bit more work to be done here but it's very close. And I think all I have to do is pass in spans here. Like this. 
Um, and then I've got to say output dot range router spec dot spans. Yeah. Okay. So now let's try again. Um, we'll re-disable. We've got to set it. Don't forget to set it. Um, spans, spans. Um, and then we've got to. Re enable this case here. And you know, while we're at it, we should just do that thing with the default value, honestly. So, we're going to say index is equal to default r dot default dest guess we can say mm, if idx is equal to negative one we'll just return an error here Um, how do I throw an error again? Um, expected error. Errors dot new. Uh, we'll say no destination for a value. Let's see, what is the what is this guy send? No span found for key. We'll pass in I'll say it's for span S. We'll pass in spans of I. Okay, and this is going to become a non pointer. So then we can create a default dest here by passing in the output dot range retrospect dot default dest. Then we'll say default, uh, I guess we'll say default dest is equal to Negative one, if default desk pointer is not equal to nil, default dest is equal to default dest pointer. All right, and then we can say default dest, default dest. Next out of range with length one in ninety nine during sort dot search. Huh. Let's try this one more time. So why would this be the case? Uh R dot spans. And spans of 
fans of i.key. So it's got to be this guy, right? Oh, it's the, is it the wrong eye? Oh yeah, it's definitely just the wrong eye. So I need to say for eye and range spans. This funk needs to just be of, of J. Index out of range five with length five. And this is in line 132. OK, so this is the selection vector code. And the issue is that I've done something wrong. Looks like I've created this thing to be insufficiently small num outputs, but that seems right. So output IDX. So, hmm. This guy is a little confusing. Um, feels like there's an off by one thing and the streams are one index or something. Is that is that what's going on here? Ah, it's, we look up we have to do this. I guess we have to do this too. So we've got to hmm. maybe there's some reason to the way that we did this span for data. So quit if this thing, make sure, and then transform it. So quit if this thing. This default desk thing is kind of throwing me for a loop. I think we just need to make a little helper function just like they did. So we'll call it. It's more like span IDX. It's more like stream for data, right? Stream for data. So we're going to make a make up here. We'll say funk r tuple range distributor stream for span. We'll say actually. So span roach pb dot span. And we're going to give back an int. And it's going to go like this. Span. So this is going to be span dot key.
just going to turn off my uh, night light thing here for a sec. Okay, so... Stream for span. Pass in a span. Hit this thing, we're going to return negative one. This thing, we're going to return negative one. Otherwise, we're going to do this little check that we didn't think of where we do this thing. Make sure that the start is less than or equal to data. So then we're going to say r r dot spans. So we're going to say r dot spans of idx dot start. And then we have to compare it with start is less than or equal to data. So I think we need to compare with our span dot key, right? Or I guess it's our span dot end key. Okay. And then we just return int of r dot spans of idx at stream. Okay. So then down here, we say stream for span of spans of i. And then we get to say As we say, like, idx is equal to this. If idx is equal to negative one, if it's this default desk thing, I guess we, I guess we should just do it their way. So the default else is nil, we'll error. Otherwise we say idx is equal to r dot default test. And I guess we intify this whole thing. And then we go like this. And then I think we are good to go. Let us try again. Yeah, you gotta see that nice backlit bookcase in my background. Big mistake to not have that on camera. Okay, so it looks like it actually worked. Holy crap. So let's go ahead and change it to be vectorized true and run again. And we're gonna run with test flags equals rewrite. Hey, it actually seems to have worked. Impressive. Well, I'm feeling pretty satisfied. I don't know about you guys, but this is this is sick. I didn't think I was going to be able to finish this project, um, but it wasn't actually so bad. It wasn't actually so bad. So I think what we're going to do now is we have to delete those prints. Oh yeah, is it faster? That's a great point. We gotta check that, we gotta check that, we gotta check that. Okay, we gotta check that. We gotta check to see if it's faster or not. Um, hold on, we just need to delete these prints and then we're gonna upload it to a little test machine and we can find out if it's any faster. Um, we gotta do that, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and say, git add two through 11. Git commit, um, SQL implement vectorized range router. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's just make sure there's no prints in here. No prints, okay. So we're gonna say make build. 
Can you visualize queries while they're running? No, unfortunately not. That'd be sick though. Like Graph Blaster style. No, not, not exactly Graph Blaster style. Wasn't there something that somebody built at Newton that was like some sort of online visualized machine for some reason? Wasn't Jack doing something like that? Did I make that up? Or Prithvi maybe? Or maybe Giannis? It was like you had all the services and there was like lines between them. How are the get dirty files numbered? It's this thing called get number. Okay, so um, we're gonna say, I have a little machine set up for this. Okay, Roach Prod put Jordan test cockroach. Is how this works? No. Jordan test cockroach. Oh yeah, and also, do you remember um, tree SCP or what was that thing called? Dist SCP. Anyway, this thing this thing does it. It's pretty pretty sick. Um, okay, so now that I've done that, I need to say Roach Prod start Jordan test one through three. Woosel factor? Lots of tiny people running on the map. <laughs> yes, I agree. You need a high Woosel factor. <clears throat> um, I need to make a workload in it. So we're just going to import some TPCH data real quick to make sure that we can run something that seems at least a bit realistic. I still think that this is not going to be the optimal way to show this off, actually, because you would need more than three nodes. You would need to have the index join on some of the nodes and the in, like the main, you need the secondary index on some of the nodes and the primary index on different nodes. I feel like if you really wanted to demonstrate the power, but this should hopefully still make it good. Crap, I still didn't, I didn't put peculiar anywhere. I, don't, I feel like I'm really bad at that. I'll put it in a commit message actually. Replication factor one. Uh, this is Vim, this is indeed Vim. <laughs> Truly Vim. It's the Vimiest Vim of all time. Um, this doesn't look like Vim to you? Yeah, the replication factor is three, but it doesn't matter because you still have leaseholders that differ. So it'll still be like distributed. It just won't be like as, it won't be like async, a symmetrically distributed in a sense. Like the computation will still be, I don't know, whatever. Um, this commit adds a vectorized implementation of the range router, which is a router that routes individual node, uh, routes rows based on where the leaseholder lives for a row that's constructed. I guess it's for a, for the range that contains a key V E that's constructed from columns from those rows. Um, hopefully this um, whatever. Ah, I just need to put peculiar. I need to put peculiar. 
This sounds peculiar, but it's pretty simple. <laughs> if you think about it, no, that's terrible. Uh, but it's somewhat, but it's not. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna do that for now, and it, probably that's not gonna last. But you know, it's all, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, so we've imported our data. So now we're gonna say Roach Prod SQL Jordan Test 1. Okay, so here's the default. We're gonna say use TPCH and we're gonna make a big old index join. So we're gonna make, let's see, show create, show tables, show create table. We'll do, maybe we'll do orders. So orders, it's got, I can use this cust key thing. So cust key, I can say select count. I, I guess I'll say select sum of O sum, I'll do sum int of O ship priority from orders at O OD. We'll do an explain on this. Oh, this has to be in quotes. That's so annoying. <laughs> oh, it's orders. That's the reason. Okay, so here we have a scan and an index join. Now let's take a look at the explained to SQL plan for this guy. Okay, what the heck? This is lame. Show ranges from OOD. Okay, well, there's not enough data on it or it hasn't been split yet. That's irritating. Show tables again. What about line item? Show create table line item. Well, honestly, it should be split. Whatever, why don't we just, I just don't want to split it at random. I want it to be nicely split according to something reasonable. So what about show ranges from table line item? Is this split up at all? Okay, at least this is split. So what about the secondary index from index L SK? See, all of the secondary indexes are not split. It's because they're small enough, so it doesn't matter. That's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing here, isn't it? It's kind of an interesting thing because it sort of... Maybe it's common that indexes all live on a single range or something. I don't know. I'm just going to split this one up at random. Alter index LSK split at LSK is a it's a int Man, this is annoying. I don't even know what values are in this thing. All right, so alter index L S K scatter. Okay, so now explain to SQL again. Oh, I need to do it. I need to make a different query. Show create table line item. So select sum int of select sum int of. So SK is going to be this sub key. So we'll do L art key from line item at LSK, plan to SQL. Okay, so how about this? Scan index join group. So here's what it looks like the old way. Here's what it looks like the old way. Okay, so here's what it looks like the old way and let's take a look at the timings here. So 
So this is six million rows. It shouldn't be shouldn't be too slow, but it does appear like it's a little slow. And it's because of that index joint. That index joint is really inefficient. Okay, so it took 28 seconds. And so now let's enable our special feature here. Let's enable our special feature. So set cluster setting. Okay, so let's do a prediction, you guys. Is anybody around who wants to do a prediction? So we're going to do a prediction. And this, the prediction is going to be... The prediction is going to be... Uh, will the new uh, range router method of index join be uh, range router slower or faster? Slower, faster. Okay, so I probably didn't make this long enough, but vote faster if you think that the next thing is going to be faster. The new stuff that we've been working on is going to be faster than the original thing. I, I probably needed to make that prediction more than one minute. Ooh, wow, somebody's going in on 1K channel points. Somebody's got to take the other side. Okay, good. We got a good bet going. We have a good bet. Okay, so we're going to run it a few times. We're going to run it a few times. I don't actually think it's going to be really significantly warm or less warm. I think that the overhead... I think that the disks are really not the slowest part of this whole operation because index join is just so inefficient. It's really what it comes down to. Okay, so 27 seconds. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Just two runs is going to be enough. So now we're going to set our special setting. Set cluster setting equal dot disk equal dot distributed join reader dot enabled equals true. Okay. And so now we're going to run explain that cache is I think that cache like is, it gets like instantly hot though, because we get them all at once. Yeah, there's got to be things, but they're minor. They're minor. They're minor. They're definitely minor. So here's our new plan, and it's a beautiful little crossed crossed over plan. And now we're gonna get to see if it's any faster. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> oh man, I'm excited! I'm excited. Yes, that graph automatically is generated. Okay, so it's so far not any, it's not like super faster. So so we've lost any hope of it being like radically. Oh, okay. You guys, hell yes. This is super faster. 18 seconds versus 30 seconds. That is super badass. That is super badass. Okay, so we're gonna have to say prediction. And we're going to have to say, choose outcome faster. Well, I'm impressed. I don't know if Yohor is still there, but uh, I'm feeling pretty good about this one. You missed the story. Okay, so we're talking about 18 seconds versus 30 seconds. So nearly, nearly double the speed. Nearly double the speed. Okay, we'll try the first one again. Just to make sure. Just to make sure. If this is 18 seconds, I'll be super disappointed, but I think it's going to be a lot slower. Twenty-eight seconds. Pretty good. Pretty good day of work, you guys. I'm feeling. I'm feeling good about this. Um, I guess this just shows to show that it's the power of batching, right? It's the power of push, and it's the power of fewer RPCs. That's what it comes down to. We have half the RPCs. 
and the batches are fatter. So it's few, less than half the RPCs, I want to say. And actually, does that add up? If you have 2x the RPCs, is the thing going to be 2x slower? <laughs> it seems like a little simplistic explanation, but it's uh, it's on par. Um, okay, so let's, let's see. Here's what we're going to do next. Latency often dominates, so it's plausible. Yeah. So this was called dist. Wait, I didn't push this thing, did I? I got to change the commit message. Hmm. All right, so we're going to say Oh, you know what we also did though? We also added a vectorized range router. No, that wouldn't have helped because we didn't even have that component. We didn't, there was, there was no, it's not like we vectorized something that was not vectorized before. Um, Um, what do you use to change the default message on git commit comments? There's like a, one of those special text files, like git slash hooks, maybe. I think it's git hooks commit message is what does it. Okay. So here's what we're going to say. Um, this PR adds a, well, This PR contains two commits that together cause index joins to be planned using a different distribution model using the by range routing policy when equal dot disks equal dot distributed join reader dot enabled is set to true. Um, the results of this PR are pretty impressive for a large index join that I, I guess I'll put this in a comment actually. Um, The second commit implements the range router in the vectorized engine. Tesla Motors, welcome back. We had a big victory. We we finished our project and the thing got twice as fast, so it's pretty exciting. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna send this out. Okay, so the results. Um, this is a relatively complete work in progress for that puts index joiners on the nodes on all nodes that have leaseholders for the primary index being joined against and uses the range router to send rows to the proper index joiner. 
it has, um, I ran one experiment with a three node TPCH cluster with impressive results, seeing almost a 2x speed up for a large aggregation for an aggregation over a full table over an index join over all of line item, the line item table. Okay, so now we get to paste our result to really blow everybody's minds. So I guess we can, let's try to clean it up a little bit. We're gonna say, We'll grab this. We'll grab this. Go I've been using for about five years. and include a second run to prove that there's no caching stuff. Setting on, I use Java. I use, I mean, at work, yes, I did use Java. I did use Java. But I feel like before Go, I used all sorts of different languages like for fun and stuff. And now I basically just use Go all the time because Go is, it's just a good general purpose language, I feel like. Closure, yeah, Closure was pretty fun. I tried Scala. Um, how do I find Go compared to Python? Um, it's similar in a lot of ways, but a lot more performant. Like, especially the slices um, in Go are much different than the slices in Python. Python copies everything. Um, Go is kind of more of a, I don't know. It gives you access to memory in a normal way, I guess. Um, I kind of also want to Im include this picture to explain to people what's going on. And then with setting off, I'll include the other picture. Um, I haven't run any experiments yet using smaller data sets or things that are closer to OLTP queries. And I expect that this policy won't be a win all of the time. We'll probably want to make some heuristic that uses the simple non disql planning method when the input cardinality to the index joiner is low, since it implies that it's probably not worth the extra setup round trips to establish the remote nodes, just the same as our policy for table reader. 
the other thing um also also to do is the same optimization for lookup joiners all right guys well um i think that's probably about it for tonight um, i'm feeling pretty good i feel like most of the time our projects do not go this well this was an unusually good project so thanks everybody for hanging out um and for all the suggestions and help and everything um, i wanted to raid somebody in particular um who i saw was gonna stream let me see if i can find them here let's see here Oh, darn. It looks like they are no longer streaming. That's too bad. That's okay. We'll find somebody else. Um, yeah, I'm also extremely amazed. I don't know how I did it. I, I thought it was going to be a lot more work than it actually was, is what it comes down to. Um, there was a bunch of patterns to, fo to follow, is, is kind of what it came down to, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the code base was pretty nicely well factored actually for this. There was a lot of things that I could reuse. There was a lot of stuff that was like already nicely there. So I, I got lucky though. I, I, it's definitely not always, that's why I was so surprised when I said this, I feel like most of the time when I do an ambitious project, it does not go this well at all. So it just, just so happened that many of the primitives were already sort of there. Um, who to raid here, who to raid, who to raid. Uh... Oh, definitely we can raid someone who's doing Lang Jam because I wanted to do Lang Jam and then didn't. Lang Jam. Okay, we're going to raid this person. All right, y'all. Thank you so much again. Um, have a great, absolute great weekend. Um, and yeah, rest of your week. You know, I hope you guys come back next week. We'll do some more fun projects. Hopefully, they'll be as fun and exciting as this one. It's probably doubtful, but hopefully we will. So thanks so much, you guys. Have a good one. Um, Till next time. Bye-bye.